Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Are you ready for my magic mystery, uh, disappearing Christmas jumper, Christmas sweater? Here you go. It's all green. I've got the green screen behind me. This is the first time I've done this. I thought, shall I change it? Nah, it's Christmas. So uh, happy Christmas, everyone. This is my Christmas live stream. I'm really looking forward to, th to this. I do these um, every uh, every year, a couple of times a year. This is every uh, penny from this goes to charity. And the charity uh, today is worldbuilders.inc. This is for those who know him. This is Patrick Rothfuss's charity, um, the uh, fantastic uh, writer, fantasy writer, um, King Killer Chronicles, uh, who uh, incidentally holds the uh, the record for the fantasy writer, the epic fantasy writer who has kept his fans waiting for the next next book for even longer than George R. R. Martin. Yes, ten and a half years, Patrick Rothfuss fans. Uh, that's how long we have been waiting. Um, so, uh, what we're going to do today is uh, is a couple of things. First of all, it's an open Q and A, so. Uh, it's a bit more relaxed than usual. If you're wanting uh, deep lore and theory, then this probably isn't the video for you. Feel free to click on to something else. Uh, but I've got a whole load of questions from my patrons. Uh, I'll be working my way through them as we go, and I'll try to pick up as much as I can in the chat as we go through. Uh, we will have a couple of random guests. I very, very last minute sent a message out to a few people to see whether they were available to come on to this. Uh, most people obviously have got better things to be doing, but uh, hopefully we will get a couple of uh, uh, special surprise guests coming on later. Um, and also, uh, we have got a special prize giveaway this year. Uh, um, this is, and I should probably say up front, uh, thank you. Uh, you know who you are, the people who donated these uh, prizes. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, but we have got some prizes to be giving away. And we're going to do this in two parts. If you are watching this live, then there are the first part of the prizes are available. And that is, um, first of all, $25 for, for my shop. I hardly ever mention it, but if you want some IDG gear, then that's where to uh, to get it. But also, far more excitingly, Timbo Took, if you do not know him, he's a fantastic um, Tolkien artist. He does a whole load of watercolours, wonderful things. I hope that somebody in the, uh, the chat will be able to put a link across to his work. So we'll get a painting from him uh, as uh, one of the prizes for the first part of this uh, live stream. The second part, and that I will say everybody who donates anything, $1, $100, whatever you want, anyone who donates any anything will get added into that. And um, a reflective rambling, one of my wonderful moderators, moderators, thank you so much, has uh, very kindly donate, uh, said that she will uh, tally up everybody who has been uh, who's been donating things, and she will let me know. Uh, perhaps you could um, tweet at me or something, uh, reflective rambling, and we will uh, try to announce in the stream at midnight my time. So that's two hours in. Uh, we will let people know who has won those first prizes. The second lot of prizes, equally exciting. Uh, another $25 from my uh, shop. $20 uh, for of um, voucher for Friday tea, which is fandom themed tea. There is a wonderful uh, sort of sub-community within here in Steep Geek, people who uh, drink tea while watching this. Uh, and so this hopefully will help you uh, uh, drink some wonderful tea while watching future live streams. And also a $25 voucher for San Rixian's uh, shop, San Rixian, another fabulous uh, artist within this community. If you've never uh, seen any of her stuff please do go i'm sure somebody in the chat will put a link uh, i will talk about them a little bit later but the main thing now is to talk about the charity first of all and then we'll get into uh talking about uh, to, uh interacting with the chat asking answering a few questions uh the the charity is worldbuilders.inc which as i say it's patrick rothfuss's charity what they do and i've i've copied across what they say. We work to unite the geek community into a massive force to fund education, opportunity, and sustainable self-sufficiency for families and communities worldwide. By partnering with established nonprofits with decades of proven success, we make the world a better place one family at a time. And that is 
exactly what I'm about here. This is one of the things I've found building this community, being a part of this wider community is quite how generous people are, quite how amazing people are. Everybody I find within the sort of the geeky communities uh, understands what it is to that there is always someone who is in more need than us. And uh, maybe at different times, uh, we do not have the ability to help others, but we recognize that. And where we can, we try to pay it forward. So uh, that's what they do. They don't try and set up this extra um, uh, infrastructure above, uh, above it all. They just send the money over to local partners, people who are working on the ground, not just giving out aid, but actually trying to help, pe help people um, to build sustainable futures through education, uh, through uh, helping support businesses, that kind of thing. So that's what we're doing today. We are just at a very basic level, trying to make the world a better place. And I just want to say thank you. A few people have uh, already donated. So uh, thank you uh, so much for that. I think we had a $5 anonymous donation to start us off. Um, I'll try and uh, shout out as many of these as I can. Then we had one from, where did we go? Lyle Hammock. Hi there, Lyle. Thank you so much uh, for your donation. Uh, a bit of love going in for the cloak of invisibility. Yep, yeah, that's exactly what it is. I could have changed out of this. I could have gone for something which made a whole lot more sense with the green screen. I just didn't. Um, uh, DZ Bank, thank you so much for your uh, donation. Um, and uh, Anonymous uh, Hermione, thank you so much. And I think, and another Anonymous. So thank you so much to uh, everybody who's donated before. Yes, the backdrop I uh, I tried. What I found, I hadn't realized this when I was, um, you'll get me going off on a lot of kind of digressions today. I'm in that kind of mood. Uh, but uh, basically, I uh, having set up the backdrop, I normally try and do it associated with what we're talking about. Um, this was what I had last time. Uh, I did try and do it for the thing I had as the thumbnail that Jon Snow in that hat. But then I found that, Actually, uh, he just appeared with this see-through jumper. Jon Snow just appeared here as if he was like emerging from my chest in a kind of like, alien way. So that didn't look very good. So I thought I'd go back to this one. So that's why we've uh, we've got The Witcher again. And I do like the picture. I think it's an excellent picture. Uh, okay, so um, let's go to... Um, uh, do, 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 do. Let's have a quick check in the chat. Um, to have you got any questions? No questions in the chat yet. Um, not that I've seen any, but there might be a few. Uh, but let's start off with uh, talking a bit about The Witcher. I would love to know what you guys think about The Witcher Season 2. Um, I will say up front, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was uh, it was fantastic. Um, it's not a, and I'm not going to do any huge spoilers here, so do not worry. Uh, it's not a particularly faithful adaptation of the books. We will come back. I've got a question about that coming up. Um, but I thought as a standalone bit of TV, I really enjoyed it. I've done a few videos on it already. I've probably got a couple more, which I will be doing a releasing over sort of the Christmas period. But I would love to know what you think, if you've got any thoughts or questions about that. Um, Lady Nymeria, thank you so uh, much. Uh, Anonymous also, thank you. Um, and Eric, uh, thank you for your donation too. Um, so let's go to a question from uh, Diego Godoy. And we're going to jump around a bit today. I think we will move. We will definitely come back to The Witcher. I'd be very happy if people want to talk about The Wheel of Time, incidentally. Uh, we've got the last episode of that is coming up pretty much after this finishes the the final episode of the wheel of time um i've been enjoying that uh, but again i'd love to know uh, any thoughts you have diego godoy saying hola robert hola uh, thank you for another fantastic year of content you are very welcome um i have a fire and blood related question the way Miseria died seemed odd to me, walking naked through the street while being whipped. Shouldn't she have seen this coming and escaped? Do you think Varys could have a similar end, him being the other prominent master of whispers? Uh, so this is a character that 
many people probably don't know huge amounts about yet but is going to be really quite big and important in uh, Fire and Blood, in, in um, House of the Dragon, which is based on Fire and Blood. Uh, Lady Misery, um, Lady Miseria, is a character who was the lover of Daemon Targaryen, and she was effectively the master or mistress of Whisperers uh, for the Blacks. Now, she starts off in, uh, well, they all start off on Dragonstone, but she bases herself in King's Landing, and her role is very important early on in stirring up the issues there, finding blood and cheese. If you know what happens there, she's the person who facilitates that. Um, and she is there when the Blacks finally take control of King's Landing. And she is aware of what's happening, and... and the the situation for the blacks is that over a long well over the six months or so that they're there in king's landing the people turn against them they turn against rhaenyra it, it, part of it is bad advice bad policy raising taxes people are starving war has been really tough on them but um it's also just one of those things that you get to the end of the war and whoever's there, it's, it's, they're not going to be welcomed unless they suddenly bring good things because they've been promised good things. Now, after Rhaenyra has to flee, Lady Misery stays in King's Landing. And at this point, we get a very confusing picture in King's Landing. We get lots of these kind of tin pot kings suddenly declaring themselves. We get three kings, one on each of the hills of King's Landing, saying, I'm the right, rightful king of, of King's Landing. It gets to be a very complicated situation. Lady Misery ends up being given the opportunity for free. She gets captured and given the opportunity of for freedom if she can walk all the way across town effectively to the Red Keep while being flogged. And I think she probably realised that it, she wasn't going to make it. She didn't. She made it barely halfway before dying. She, as, as with all masters and mistresses of Whisperers, is... is <sighs> not held in high regard by the common people, let's put it that way. So uh, the, the question is, why why did she submit herself to that? It wasn't my reading of it. It, it wasn't really an, an optional thing. She was, she was made to do this. The bigger question is, why didn't she see that the writing was on the wall and leave? That we are not told. She, she could have gone earlier and she didn't. So she decided to stay... Who knows? I'm, it's one of the many mysteries that I'm hoping we will, and this will be like season five or something uh, of House of the Dragon, one of the many mysteries that I'm hoping we will get um, uh, unearthed uh, during the uh, uh, the show. Um, just quickly a check back on the chat. Um, and we've got... Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, Justin M saying, this is talking about Netflix. Uh, it seems to me, regardless of how faithful the Netflix is to its source material, it's still a good show. I mean, I think that's generally my view, is that it's not 100%, and I will get into details later if you want it, but um, uh, the, it's not 100% uh, faithful either to the plot. It, it gets it, it starts in the right place, ends roughly in the right place, but there's a lot in the middle that goes in slightly different directions, including a few quite big issues. And also there are a few characters that they've changed their motivations a little bit. Uh, Cameron uh, saying um, a theory on the Sword of the Morning. Um, this relies on the theory that Ashara Dane is Mira Reed's mother. And due to Dornish custom, just as much of a namesake as Edric or Darkstar. What are the chances that Mira will be the Sword of the Morning rather than Darkstar? Sure, she isn't the typical image of a knight. Yeah, so Mira Reed is the almost certainly the heir 
of uh, House Reed. We don't know huge amounts. We don't. We know hardly anything about House Reed. It has to be said. Um, but uh, the the way that they are introduced, Mira and Jodrin, is uh, Mira Reed and Lady Mira and Jodrin. That's the way that they're formally introduced to Bran, who is there as the representative of Rob. This is very clear that, that Mira is the the senior partner out of the two of them. So uh, that's the situation. Why on earth do they have um, what appears to be f uh, either female preference primogeniture or um, equal opportunities inheritance which is not a thing that happens pretty much anywhere in the seven kingdoms other than dawn unless howland reed has married someone from dawn this is just a very small part of the is it possible that ashara dane is actually in the um marriage to howland reed there in the neck hiding away so if that's the case, then we have Mira Reed, who's um, there as a potential claimant to be Sword of the Morning. She is not. It has to be said. If, you, if we're saying the Sword of the Morning is is the um, the member of House Dane who is worthy of it, she is not a member of House Dane. So technically speaking, no, she is not going to be um, the the heir. She is not going to be the person who can uh, take the sword of the morning and uh, take take dawn and be called the sword of the morning. So no is the short answer. Um, that does not mean that she is not going to get an impressive uh, sword. She will. I personally think she will go north of the wall she will uh, in and well, we know she's north of the wall but in blood raven's cave she will find dark sister legendary valyrian steel sword um and she will take that with her back down to winterfell so that's that's where i think we're going with this there was um a, a moment in the show that kind of hinted at it, it has to be said. They didn't make anything of it, but this was something they did on Game of Thrones' TV show, was when there was something that they knew was a book plot point, but they weren't going to pick up on it, then they kind of lingered the camera on, on it for a while. So, for example, the Sword Dawn itself, they didn't ever make anything of that, but they did... When we saw the sword, they let the camera just linger on it for a little bit. And the same thing happened here with uh, Mira leaving Blood Raven's cave and heading down south. When they're running away, the camera lingered on her grabbing a sword from Blood Raven's cave and heading down south. So uh, I think that was a nod to the fact that it's something that we can expect to see. Um, Let's have a quick uh, check. Uh, Clueless Fangle, thank you so much. The very generous um, uh, donation. Thank you so much. Um, I think, uh, if anything, uh, the way to say thank you to the Clueless Fangirl for uh, for that is just by adding her to the stream. Hello. I hope this is working. I'm not really sure. It absolutely is. This is our, our first of maybe one, maybe two, who knows how many random surprise guests. Um, for those who do not know, this is Helen, who uh, has come as Wonder Woman, which is absolutely wonderful. Uh, anyone who doesn't know you, do you want to just introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm Diana. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, hi, everybody in the chat, sorry. Uh, this is a uh, weird setup. Can you, this is weird because I just see half of my face, but I think it's different for you guys. So here we are. Oh yeah, look, my bar. I'm the woman with the bar. Um, hi, I'm the Clueless Fangirl, AKA Helen. Excellent. And and for those who do not know, Helen has got a fantastic uh, Lord of the Rings channel. I was going to say, is, is it just Lord of the Rings now? Or are you also doing Book of Boba Fett? If so, tell us about the Book of Boba Fett. 
Yeah, so I'm awaiting a lot of questions. I uh, I told Robert beforehand, um, I won't answer any DC questions. This is just a costume, people. Relax. Um, but yeah, no, I want to cover a book of Boba Fett uh, and thinking about, you know, doing more Star Wars because after Lord of the Rings, Star Wars is my second love. And uh, yeah, I'm excited for the show. I mean, I'm excited for Obi-Wan. So, you know, people in the chat, drop some money i'll answer all the star wars questions you have excellent and just a very quick hello uh timbo took is in the yeah, chat uh, here. Uh, hi there um who has uh very kindly um donated a painting a picture for for this as Aww. a prize so uh thank you so much uh he is a wonderful artist it has to be said he's um uh, I mean, I, I'm sure half Hobbit himself in the very, very best way. Um, he is uh, an amazing uh, person, does fantastic art. And I'm sure if you're watching live, then one of the moderators will drop something um, into the chats, giving uh, links across to that. Um, but Helen, I am intrigued. We'll, we're not going to um, talk too much about um, B Book of Boba Fett, but when is it out? What? And, <laughs> and, okay, talk about it for as long as you wish. Uh, uh, when is it out and why should we be excited about it? Um, well, I think it's dropping on the 29th. I think that is still correct. Um, and it won't be, you know, they won't pull a witch on us. So it's every Wednesday. I think it's eight or nine episodes. Last time I checked, I'm sorry, I'm not really prepared for this, but I promise <laughs> it will <laughs> it will be prepared when it's on my channel now. Um, I am excited for it. Because, you know, since I was a small girl, um, Boba Fett was one of the characters um, where sadly from the standalone, from from the OG movies, we don't know a lot about him, but I mean, that dude was so cool. Look at his armor, you know? And so we learned a lot more about his backstory um, in the prequels. Um, there are comics about him, you know, Jango Fett um, and Boba, the, the whole story is explained. Um, and yeah, there's a lot um, in the old legends uh, um, lore about Boba. So yeah, he's a fascinating character. And I always love this, you know, like, run down underworldy stuff which we got in um ah uh, what what was the name um uh in the han solo movie which doesn't exist for me canon wise <laughs> but <laughs> but you know we, we got a lot of this crimson dawn and this underworld and you know the rundown part of the galaxy not the shiny politics and whatnot so that always interested me so um and this is what the boba show will be about there will be apparently cameos um from uh the crimson dawn people so you know daenerys uh will be there and apparently uh, show up luke will most likely show up canon wise baby yoda so many you know like i, th I think they're weaving this universe now and yeah I'm, I'm excited i mean i think more excited for um the obi-wan show but boba is starting this off for me excellent and this is the the huge franchise that disney are going as obviously they've obviously got marvel as well but uh yeah. so many of these different uh um uh providers we've got netflix are going huge on uh the witcher we've got hbo yeah. are going big on uh, game of thrones this is something that uh, they are obviously going massive on they've got what is it eight nine different spin-offs going on at the moment that was a question <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm reading the chat. That's, that's um, okay. So just, um, well, I will take the moment to say uh, the Hammer Time 51, thank you so much uh, for your uh, donation. Uh, Timbo Took, thank you uh, as well. That's it. very generous of you as well. Um, and Matt uh, is in the chat, Not of the Rings. Oh, no, the rings. Excellent. Well, it's a delight to have you uh, have you here as well. I will, I'm going to see whether I can persuade him to perhaps jump on a, a little bit later as well. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, thank you so much for everyone who's uh, uh, donating. For those who are just coming in, this is my charity live stream. So instead of Super Chats today, uh, I'm asking for donations to a fantastic cause. This is World Builders, um, which is Patrick Rothfuss's charity. And the, the idea is not just to sort of uh, send money to 
you know, feed people who are starving. Yes, that's important, but this is about helping to grow um, and helping people to become self-sustainable. It's about education. It's about helping to support local businesses. And it's not about coming in over the top and saying we know best. It's about working with local partners and, and understanding from them where uh, where best money can go. So so it's a really worthy cause. Um, at this time of year, it's fantastic to be able to just uh, take a step back and go, actually, there are people who need uh, money who are in greater need than me right now. So if you can possibly help out, then um, I would hugely appreciate it. As I say, it's uh, every, every bit of uh, proceeds from this will be going to that um uh, so helen uh, you uh, you don't want to talk about dc um is there anything <laughs> uh, is is there anything you wanted to talk a little bit about obi wan though so let's talk a little bit about obi wan so this is this is you mcgregor's back for this isn't he this is uh this is going is it a mini series what what are we what are we talking about here when is it set yeah. first of all is it is like later on in his life um, yes, obviously, this is um, the part of his life, you know, when he's watching over Luke and Leia, well, mostly over Luke, because he's on Tatooine, he's mostly based on Tatooine. But, um, you know, from from legend stories we get, and, you know, Filoni and all these people now, they seem to include more and more legends material into the new Star Wars canon, which thank God. Um, and, oh, people appreciate my Christmas tree. Tr sorry, I'm like a child with a shiny object. I'm talking and uh, interacting with the chat. No, so um, this is his time, um, you know, when when they are still little. We don't exactly know how old they'll be, if they will show up. I assume they will show up. Maybe teenagers, kids, like 10-ish, that would be um, my, my guess. And I do think he's interacting, he's still in contact with Bail Organa, which I would love um, because, you know, this is Bail stands for the politics in Star Wars, right? He was a former senator, he ran against the emperor, didn't win um, and he is a very important person in, in the Star Wars universe, not just Leia's father who taught her a lot of things, right? And I want to see this side of Star Wars, you know, not just him being on Tatooine, please. Like, seriously, we have enough of Tatooine. Um, and um, this is what Kathleen Kennedy, so she's the main producer behind all this, um, and she teased, I think like a year ago, um, that we will have a standoff and the fight of the century, a rematch of the century, I think she called it. And it's pretty confirmed. Uh, you saw it on Star Wars Day or whatever it was called like a few weeks ago. Um, you saw um, it will be the rematch of Obi-Wan and Vader. They will meet. Um, well, we don't know. It kind of looked like Mustafa. I'm not sure this is where Vader's castle is. I, I, We don't know. We don't have any trailer. We have nothing. So I assume it will drop summer-ish. That's my guess. Um, and yeah, so so we will have the Anakin, Vader, um, Obi-Wan, but also, you know, the politics and Obi-Wan still, you know, looking in the galaxy for for survivors of Order 66. So I'm really excited for, for that. Uh, yeah, I am too, actually. this is the, Those are the two that I'm most looking forward to in the Star Wars world. I'm, I am a Star Wars fan, not quite as nerdy about this as, as, as Star Wars as I am on other things, but I just, I do really enjoy it. And those are the two uh, of the different shows that I've seen that I thought, yes, I'd love to see that. Uh, Mike McFly saying, um, Robert, I definitely enjoyed The Witcher a lot. I'm not sure if you know Netflix uh, track record of recreating fantasy or even other IP properties. Not the best, but I think they're doing great with it. Yeah, I think I would agree. I think they're doing uh, a good job as i say we'll talk a little bit more about the how well they adapted the source material in a moment the uh, nerd of the rings thank you so much very uh, very kind of you to uh, to donate thank you um stringer studios thank you um and um, Mike McFly just saying, I'm glad that you and Aziz got a kick out of the question about Geralt and Dark Sister from Last Life. Yeah, he did very much enjoy that, I have to say. And uh, I uh, I will again give due credit to, uh, this was Ashaya who asked the question um, about where Dark Sister was rather than uh, Aziz. And he, uh, he always gets the credit and, and Ashaya definitely deserves it. Anonymous, thank you so much for your $5 uh, donation. Misting, uh, thank you so much. Very kind for your donation. Um, 
do, do question from uh, where have we got? Uh, Reflective Rambling saying, um, my question, this is picking up a question for Stringer Studios saying, my question is about Hard Home. I believe that the Targaryens destroyed it looking for Bravos. Does that mean dragons can go north of the wall? Uh, this is a really interesting one. Um, I'm, I'm going to allow Helen to be silent on this because she's not the, uh, the, the Song of Ice and Fire nerd. Uh, but Yes, this is this is one of those things that if you've not really looked into it, it's just a mystery. It's it's presented as a mystery in the world of ice and fire. Basically, hard home, which we know from um, from the episode, obviously of Game of Thrones. This is where the wildlings gathered, but it's got history to it, and the history is that um, it was once the closest thing they had to a city, and then. About, and I can't remember exactly what it was, something like 600 years uh, ago, it just got destroyed. And we don't know what happened. We know two things. First of all, we know that people were taken away in ships, people were kidnapped and captured. And secondly, we know that something there was made lots of fire. Uh, so Big and massive was this conflagration that you could see it from the wall. This is hundreds of miles away. And it was absolutely burned to a crisp. And from that moment on, the, the wildlings didn't live there anymore, understandably. And this was a mystery. Nobody ever claimed credit for this. It was just what happened. Now, the the best guess that anyone has got is that... I think, is that this was, as you say, this was the um, um, Valyrians who were hunting for the city of Bravos. Now, the city of Bravos basically was a rebel state. Uh, they were slaves who had escaped from the Valyrian freehold. They'd set up their own state and they were making a success of it. Um, and it makes absolute sense that the Valyrians would go hunting for it and try to to destroy it so they have a motivation what we know the two things we know is that there were people being kidnapped and there was something to do with fire because everything was burned that fits with tar with uh, the uh, dragon hypothesis so they've got the means uh, and the opportunity to do it um they might have heard that that's where the free folk are again that's a fair guess. This is maybe what the Bravoses would be saying. We're free folk. We're not slaves. We're free folk. So you could understand how a kind of a misunderstanding might have happened. But uh, nobody's ever claimed responsibility for it. The question here, though, is an interesting one. Does this mean, if this is the case, does this mean that dragons can go north of the wall? And we know that dragons, generally speaking, or at least the one dragon we've ever known about, uh, which um, was Queen Alison's dragon, as she went to the wall, she tried to fly it north of the wall and it didn't want to go or couldn't go. And the assumption is that this is because the wall is not just a physical barrier, there's magic built into the base of it, uh, which does seem to provide some kind of a block for example john and a ghost when they're on different sides of the wall they cannot um uh, they can't communicate with each other sort of mentally in the way that they usually do so there does seem to be something going on there now we don't know how far this magical line goes does it go all the way around the world it doesn't doesn't seem likely does it stop somewhere before you get to essos probably if so could dragons have flown sort of up and around it and over the top yes it seems entirely reasonable so that's my general take is that i, th I think that this this does seem likely that it was dragons who did this it was the valerians who did this and it does seem likely that they went around the magic rather than uh rather than anything else uh helen have you got anything to add to that about dragons going north of the wall no. Sorry, I'm completely <laughs> not listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I will just witter on to myself about this. Um, let's quickly go through a um, question from um, Maura Lee saying, In Deep Geek would look fabulous dressed as a Jedi. Well, thank you very much, Mara. Um, uh, I do actually have maybe another time. I've got I've got, I've got a Jedi dressing gown, uh, but, but that's not not for now. It uh, it's it keeps me warm, nice and snuggly and warm in the mornings. Um, how 
What was that? Uh, it hasn't been at all. Okay, Helen's gone rogue and oh, is now that. is now Wonder Woman with a lightsaber. That's it's not working. Oh, no. What? Okay, I'm very confused. I'm just I don't know. Maybe maybe people watching this are making more out of this than I am. All I can see is is Helen waving a lightsaber. Okay. Um, anyway, I'm very distracted by that. So let's go, <laughs> let's go back to the chat. Taryn, thank you very much for your uh, donation. Um, uh, Danny, thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, just see if we've got any more that I might have missed. Anonymous, thank you very much. And I think that's me caught up um well while you're here helen though i know you're you're a witcher fan you've watched the witcher what did you make of it did you enjoy it yes well it was first of all it was way less confusing than the first uh series uh no i really really enjoyed it i uh love they introduced new characters i'm not mad about it I, well the thing is i read the books like 15 years ago or something like that uh, outing myself as being very old here but um yeah i'm i'm the, the parts that i remember i'm not mad about you know like um uh, emre's like series dad oh spoiler people sorry um <laughs> but you deserve to be spoiled you know if you haven't seen it by now um no but but series dad being revealed and all that i'm not mad that it happened quite early because it makes sense plot wise i think it's visually beautiful um <laughs> Gerald speaks more and is not just broody and angry. Uh, no, I really like the dynamics and yeah, big, big fan. I think for me, this was this year, maybe, you know, I, I don't know if you've already talked about the, the Wheel of Time, if you'll have people from, from the Wheel of Time on. Um, but I do think for me, it was the best show. Let me think what was out there. I mean, I really enjoyed Loki, but I think it was the best show out there this year in 2021. I don't know. What would you say? Yeah, I, I I have really enjoyed it. I mean, I did like Loki. It was it was good. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think The Witch is the one that's really captured my imagination the most. Uh, I do like The Wheel of Time. Uh, I felt it's um, it started a bit slow. I think the there was a middle couple of episodes which I thought were absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm really looking forward to the ending just to see how they wrap it all up. Um, that's another thing where they've um, they've broken free from the, the stories. I mean, I, I absolutely forgive people for not having read the books because these are massive books. Um, but they they have even more than The Witcher. I would say they have broken free from the the story of what is there they started in the same place they ended i hope i suspect they will end in the same place but there are some episodes where it's almost completely different um i think the thing i found with the wheel of time was i actually quite liked the new stuff i thought that was in many ways even better than what they replaced um the the witcher I kind of understood it in as much as Blood of Elves. If you've never read it, it's quite a it's quite a bridging novel. It's a matter of getting from the short stories, which are very uh, clear in themselves. The identity of each of the individual uh, short stories is very um, uh, clear and strong. And then the later stories from Time of Contempt onwards, the the narrative is very clear. Blood of Elves kind of it's a little bit bitty. It doesn't have an overall narrative arc. It is just getting us from one point to another. So I understood the need to add in some things. Um, some of those changes will be a bit more controversial, I suspect, than others. But for me, it was more a matter of changing particular characters' motivations than anything else. Um, Let's uh, let's go to. I, I was going to dot around a bit, but as we're talking about the Witcher, um, let's. I did have a question or two on this uh, from. Um, where was I? There we go. Uh, uh, this is uh, Darista, uh, which is my 
attempt at doing a Polish name. I'm, I'm getting better at this, but I'm still a long way. So apologies <laughs> Not for, really, uh, but okay. That. Oh, don't, don't, <laughs> Helen, I'm, I'm trying my best. Robert, um, this is, okay, Robert, so people keep asking in the chat why they just see your face. So what is happening? Where's you, you, your... you, you clearly weren't here at the very no. beginning, Helen. No. no. So I will explain what? for those who, who were not here at the very beginning. So I have uh, my uh, big and exciting mm. extravagance this year with my live streams is getting a green screen behind me. And, and I've never worked with a green screen before. It's not I'm not like a professional in any stretch of the imagination. And I completely forgot uh, that you cannot wear green in front of a green screen. Uh, and uh, if this is... It never uh, occurred is, uh, to if, you. If you've never... If you, and, and as I said, I've never worked in it before. I don't tend to wear green in my average everyday life. So, um, But I thought I'd wear a festive Christmas jumper, which is... Uh, a very nice festive Christmas jumper, but it's obviously very green. And then I put it on and then I saw this and I thought I could change back out to something really boring, but I, I'll just go with it. So it's it's a look I've decided I quite like just having my head kind of like floating around like this. Um, I did have uh, a different background on to start with, which is the one that's the thumbnail, uh, which is a picture of Jon Snow with a nice Santa hat on. But I found that where he was placed was just about here and it looked like he was just emerging out of my chest um so i i went against uh that one but yes that's that's why i've got me I now mean, i could take it off but i quite i quite like it i quite just yeah, yeah it works for me um <laughs> is, is that, is that all right distracted. Helen? yeah i'm mainly distracted by gerald's you know back so it's his like, sword like, yes <laughs> i am I'm, I'm aware um uh, okay, let's go to uh, the chat. Oh, yeah, jumper equals sweater for any Americans. Uh, thank you, Carl Karsnark, for uh, uh, translating a jumper. Uh, does mean uh, sweater. Um, and uh, I've got uh, Sasuke. Thank you so much uh, for for your donation. Uh, Andrew K saying I was somewhat ambivalent of the Witcher, um, ambivalent on the Witcher season one, but felt season two was a massive up upgrade on practically every cinematic and artistic level. Yeah, I think one thing we can say without, uh, I think, much fear of contradiction is that the the quality of the production uh, certainly in season two was was up quite a lot on season one. I don't, I didn't think season one was at all low budget or bad, but I think season two it just looked a whole lot better. Um, Anyway, I was going to go to a question about um, uh, The Witcher uh, from the uh, Polish person whose name I will not attempt to pronounce because I'll just get mocked again. Um, <laughs> I, I try to understand what international readers found interesting in the books. I'm not a gamer, but I was told that one of the pillars of success for video games were influences of Slavic mythology. Meanwhile, in the books, some monsters and short stories, uh, The Witcher and Bounds of Reason are clearly inspired by Polish and Slavic legends, but the rest refer to more broadly European mythologies, legends and fairy tales. So what is unique for you in The Witcher books? Well, I'll throw this one to you, Helen. What's um, uh, what's your take? It, it, this does clearly come out from this kind of a, a, Euro, a Eastern European kind of uh, folkloric tradition, but not uniquely. I would say there's there's a much a much broader um, yeah. fairy tale uh, world that he's building on. But what's what's your take? What do you think makes it unique? Well, it, it it does make it unique exactly that because normally you know people well I mean Tolkien didn't maybe later on this is why I'm here actually we will talk about Tolkien but um, no I really I am East European I grew up with this you know you see all these people and I really like that I played the games I played Witcher three and I really loved it and you see all the little side characters and the, the random people walking in the game but even also in the show and um, they're very superstitious they're very like like what do you want you know they're unfriendly and all that and if you've ever been in east europe and if you know east europeans this is very typical um this is not because you know they're nasty people or anything but this superstition you know is deep within it's rooted deep within these people and um they re it's not like oh it's a fairy tale for them this is really true you know i i was born in transylvania and um so i, I know i know <laughs> Get your very jokes weird, in now, guys. Is, is, 
<laughs> is this like the crossover that people were looking for the Jedi Wonder Woman that was born in Transylvania anyway um, but no I, I really love this about the Witcher that it comes across you know these people feel very real it doesn't really feel for me like playing the game and watching the show being from that part of the world feels true to it and this is because Sapkowski you know he is Polish right um, he, he's not somebody like Bram Stoker who invented Dracula and never been to Romania right uh, or Transylvania so it's very it's very different and it's real and I really like that aspect but you know like dragons and all that that is not from the East European mythology that is very um, you know like G Germanic and, and whatnot um, and Anglo-Saxon uh, mythology so he mixes these uh, things up and even the dwarves and stuff so but I like it and it makes it yeah like a real world it does and I think one other thing that I would say which I don't I don't think it's necessarily unique to the Witcher world, but uh, it particularly strongly comes across, I think, in the books, is that you get a lot of high fantasy worlds that appear kind of stuck. Uh, they The technology has been as it was for thousands of years. You've got, like, the magic has been there, but it's not yeah. really moved on. The Witcher world, when you read the books, it just feels on the edge of something. It feels like yeah. you have That's universities... Changing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You've got scholars, you've got inventions that are happening that, that, that you just stumble across these random inventions. Uh, you get people who are, um, you get, well, you get monsters with like these little serial numbers on the side of them. You get the, the, there's there's all these kind of things that make you feel like it's maybe it's like close to not an industrial revolution, but a renaissance. Something is just around the corner. It feels like there has been some progress, which which adds to this uh, feel of it as being um, near to something quite cataclysmic because also we feel like we're close to some sort of apocalypse or something. It's yeah. just that what's what's building, what's brewing, it, there's, there's a, a, a sense of this not just being a stable world that we want to save, it's that where is this world going to? Yeah, and, and the changing, you know, like the witches basically dying out, right? Um, and they are fighting this, you know, they're fighting against this, but it's this, yeah, this end of the world scenario. Um, no, I, I really like that, yeah. Absolutely. And I like the magic, and I like the, the magic aspect of it. You know, everybody who has played the games knows that, you know, when you have the, and you see it in the series eight, teeny tiny bit you know uh when when he ignites the sword when they drink the little potions to fight you know whatever the brooks are or whatever they're fighting um or that end thing um but but the, but the thing is you know i i love this aspect of there is and this is very similar to wheel of time you know the explanation um for okay so this is a magic system and you can learn it you can learn a magic system i really you know i'm somebody who likes to ask questions and likes to learn things and i really like that because in Tolkien you don't get that sadly uh, magic is very vague um and not explained and here it is explained and i like that system because again it makes it feel feel real and that it could be real it does, yeah. So, and it's also magic is um, different in the extent that non magical people can do bits of it. It's quite accessible in, in yeah. the sense that the witches can. So, it's not just you get this small amount of people who can do magic. Mm -hmm. It's something that you can, if you're, if you've got just like even a spark of something in you, then you can do something mm -hmm. and you can use that. You get the magical potions. There is a lot more going on there. Um, let's get to another question. In fact, you want a question about Lord of the Rings, don't you? So, chat. <laughs> can somebody, uh, as, as we this have is why got... Wonder Woman is here. Wait, you didn't have any um, of your patron questions, Lord of the Rings? Uh, no, my patrons decided in, in their infinite wisdom not to ask any questions about the Lord of the Rings, which is a shame. Uh, but um, if, if, any, if anyone in the chat wishes to ask why elves are the worst, now is the time <laughs> to do that. Shut uh, up. <laughs> or, or or anything and, and I should try and give uh, Helen a little bit of uh, credit the, the, she is an, an expert on the world of Tolkien and if you want uh, a little bit more information about what's um, 
uh, any of the details of like the first stage and the kinds of stuff that I haven't focused on so much in my videos, then Helen is an excellent person uh, to ask questions of. Mara Lee, thank you so much for your donation, uh, as well as uh, Anonymous uh, Lost for Words. Thank you. Uh, as well as very uh, generous of you and Anonymous as well. Thank you. I think that's me caught up on the donations. And we're over £500 now, everyone. Uh, all $500, Yay. I should say, uh, which is excellent. Uh, so thank you Make all very pounds. much. Make it pounds, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, oh, uh, I have been told that my pronunciation of the Polish name was correct. So uh, uh, there you go. Um, by the very person themselves, Helen. So uh, we will have less of your mockery. Uh, <laughs> I want to be forward, nice please. to you, whatever. Uh, so well, Dale, Dale, Dale Brooks has a question. Um, go on, then. Under or over 30%, we will see the Blue Wizards in the show. So, Robert, what is your take on that? Under or over 30% likelihood of seeing the Blue Wizards? I don't know. Uh, just say, do you want to see them or not? <laughs> Let's not yes, complicate it. Yes, I want it. to see for those that, Sorry, for those who don't know, the, the Order of Wizards, the Astari, that we know about Gandalf and Saruman and Radagast as well, there are two extra wizards, the Blue Wizards. Now, these talking kind of had a number of different versions of this but basically we we think that they were around in the second age as well which is when the tv show is uh, going to be based off in the east doing good things as far as we can tell now does that mean we're going to see them probably is my take so i would put it over 30 percent um uh, what exactly they'll be doing we know so little about this still i i it it gets me every time. We still don't even know what it's called. They haven't told us. It's not the Lord of the Rings. It's That's not what it's going to be called. It's going to be based thousands of years before the Lord of the Rings. Um, but uh, I think we had another question uh, for Helen. Uh, oh, this is Hermione saying, where do hobbits come from? Are they descendants of men or elves? Um, they were not created as a race, were they? So there you go, Helen. You have your very own Lord of the Rings question. Oh, but I wanted to answer the, the wizard's question. Oh, that. answer the wizard's question, <laughs> then go on to talk about hobbits, you see. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, wizards, okay. Now, um, so what I believe, so obviously we know they arrived canon-wise, or at least Gandalf and Saruman, uh, and Radagast arrived a bit later, right? So it wouldn't fit to what we know as of now. Um, but then, you know, apparently um, there are people falling from the sky and arriving in Middle-earth with meteorites. I don't know if you've read that. That is one of the newest scoops um, that apparently will happen anyway. Blue Wizards, um, I really want this magical counterpart because, right, we will see Sauron. Um, Sauron may be in the form of Anatar or Sauron, we don't know yet, right? So you have this magic user, this very overpowered magic user. I don't think we will have Gandalf. So you need, you can't just have elves and men and whatnot. You need a magical counterpart. And I do think the wizards would come in handy for that because I can't imagine anything else. Obviously, you know, you have strong warriors and whatnot, but that's not the same. In the Lord of the Rings, it worked so well because you had Gandalf. Um, and yeah, and, and you know, the, the Nazgul, which kind of also had this magical, you know, because of the rings and whatnot um, aspect, like the Witch King of Angmar. So I really do think, and I want this magical counterpart. So I would like for them to show up. That's my take. Excellent. Well, I... I think I would agree with that. Um, I'll, I'll, I will answer the Hobbits one and then throw you another question. Um, <laughs> we're getting plenty of questions. So uh, the the thing about uh, how Tolkien wrote about this world, which is it's quite endearing in a way, is that he doesn't write it as this kind of like uh, normal author writing about something. He kind of has himself within his creation as being this kind of scholar who's who's discovering these these old manuscripts and he's just trying to pick pick out what happened and so he he often write, writes well it's quite likely that such and such a thing happened and it's like this is your invention you should know this but he's actually he's put himself into his own creation as, mm. as this this uh the, the scholar who's researching effectively uh, the history of middle earth and that's where we get with the hobbits is so he he says hobbits probably 
descended uh, they're, they're cousins of humans effectively so they came part of you know an offshoot of humanity so that's where they are they're not elves as far as we know they're not um uh, another creation so far as we know uh, they're an offshoot of humans who just lived apart from them for so long that just became different so Mm-hmm. That's where Hobbits come from. We've got um, a little bit of uh, uh, controversy about the idea that maybe there might be some Hobbits in the Second Age, um, mm-hmm. but I, I kind of go with the view that if you've got, if they are an offshoot of humans, then some sort of proto Hobbits definitely would have been around during that time. That makes absolute sense to me. So I, I don't think there's a, a real problem there. Um, Reflective rambling, pick up a question for Preparable Prep. How did Smeagol fall for the ring so instantaneously as one of the river folk uh, uh, related to hobbits? Aren't hobbits and the hobbit kind more resistant to the ring's evil? Go on, Helen, you can answer this one then. No, Gollum is one of your favourite characters, but um, no, well, he, he he didn't fall for it immediately. And the way how Gollum is described, you know, he it's not like he was um, the bestest um, of, um, where, where was, I, I don't know the race, his race, I forgot. Um, but, but, you know, he, he was very nosy and his, his relatives were already, suspicious of him he he, you know he already had these qualities and what does the ring do the ring you know like um enhances the 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 qualities and wishes and whatnot you have right so um he he didn't he he didn't fall he 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 didn't became the golem he was you know later in the uh in at the end of the third age at the war during the time of the war of the ring right He, he wasn't that person right away um yeah yeah, I, I agree completely. So he he became Gollum later, but when he started out, the ring does um, it works with what what it's got. So you, it turns out Smeagol was not. We 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 portray him as this kind of lovable, lovable hobbit, but he wasn't. He was actually quite a no. nasty person to start with. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the ring just sort of built on that. So um, that's why he did descend to be. Gollum, uh, because of the fact that he um, w- didn't start out as a nice person. Bilbo did, Frodo did, Sam did, uh, but that's why they weren't as affected by the ring when they were carrying it. Uh, but Gollum wasn't uh, a very nice person. Um, we have another question um, uh, somewhere. I think we had a question about Boba Fett's armor. Mike McFly uh, saying, Clueless Fangirl, take this respectfully, but you look as a very beautiful German Wonder Woman. Uh, so I take that as a compliment. But what are your thoughts about Boba Fett's armor not being true Mandalorian? Um, I don't understand this question, but it, what, what are your thoughts on this? But what does he exactly mean? Because he takes off um, the, the, the helmet and, and it's supposed to what we learned in the Mandalorian. You're not supposed to do that. Because the armor is, if if you take it off, if you take it from the starts, from the Mandalorian, first Mandalorian Wars, or Mandalore, the ultimate, or all the, like, it changed over time. There is no true armor. You know, Sabine then invented this thing to to break down the, the shield of the armor, but I d- it is a Mandalorian armor. I don't really understand the, the question. Maybe he can specify it, because it is a... There is no one Mandalorian armor. Okay. Uh, well, m- it changed can... over time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Perhaps, perhaps you can clarify that one in the chat. Uh, Kaius Bellarina asking the questions we all need answering: Why are elves the worst, and which elves are the worst? Oh, you can you can keep this question for when does Matt come later on? I think he said Matt's where, coming he said, later. Yeah. If if, uh, if Matt, I know that the is, is on, then uh, we will we will Matt's, definitely ask. Uh, ask Matt him loves Matt's the list. Dwar- yes. Matt loves the dwarves, and Matt and I have a you know w- one day we'll have a shoot out about elves and dwarves um and you know justice for thingle um and uh yeah so elves are the best i mean i don't understand your question well elves are not the best and, and matt's entirely right about this um the 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 thing we have to remember 
um, and I'm not going to get into this because I suspect that Matt will give a better answer than me on this one. But the Silmarillion is basically elven propaganda. Uh, and uh, we all you have to do to understand why elves are the worst is just to read the names that they come up with for anyone who is not them. The humans, uh, I, I wish I had it in front of me to read it all out, uh, but they just had this whole series. So they referred to them as... I can't remember if it was stunted, nasty people or, or smelly folk or something. They just had this whole series of like really bad names for anyone who's not them. The, there was these uh, these group of dwarves who became known as the Petty Dwarves because that's what the elves <laughs> called them, Petty Dwarves, which is quite a, a, a derogatory name in you the first place. You want to say that but, meme was a was a nice character. I like do, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that just because he's perhaps not a paragon of virtue does not mean that every single one of the dwarves should have been annihilated by the elves. But um, we, they we didn't will... Know. They, they thought they, they were did. animals. Nobody told them. Well, animals that can speak. Um, anyway, so the elves Fairy are the worst tale. because they hate everyone else. Uh, is my general take on that one? Elves don't um, feel hate. That is That is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that's just fair no you've got that wrong no but, um, but seriously but i'm i want to redeem myself here not as a dwarf lover but um i was writing a video about eregion uh and about who the actual uh it just dropped uh, on my channel by the way um and it, you know i did some digging and research about who actually founded eregion right uh, was it Celebrimbor or was it caladriel and Celeborn? so there are two different versions Tolkien gave us and it, it's a really cool because i didn't know that actually or i forgot and that the dwarves actually saved Elrond's ass, they saved Galadriel's ass, you know. They say, oh, they're, oh no, Yoiston is in the chat, okay. Yoiston is <laughs> um, in the chat. Yeah, awesome. um, he will back me up on this. Um, he likes elves. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so I learned, you know, that the dwarves actually um, especially saved Elrond's ass. Um, and so he could found Imladris then. So, you know, mea culpa they're not that bad and you know as a girl and these dwarves during the um a battle um of the sudden flames uh they also saved some elves and you know they fought the dragon so okay i i give them some points some points okay well um i did some points <laughs> all, all you're gonna give them um we have had some clarification however about the the question with the armor um, oh. Mike McFly saying it's not made of the same material, and Mattia Dominique saying I oh, think it's about the armor not being made out of Beskar. Uh, so uh, hopefully that makes a little bit more sense to you. Yeah, but you know that that's a good thing because um, Sabine basically, um, you know, in, invented uh, the, the the machine to destroy that. So it's a good thing for him. But yes, I, I mean, what is it like? Do do I hate do I hate that or do I? I I do not. This is not my fandom, so I do not know if, whether this is controversial yeah. or not. I'm not mad. I'm not. I'm not mad about it. It's more, you know, being a Mandalorian, and I think this is a beautiful thing, and this is very similar to what The Witcher tells us about family and adopting things. You know, Mandalorians were actually once a race, but now being a Mandalorian, and you see that in the Mandalorian in Din Djarin, um, is being basically adopted and adopting a culture and a way of living, and then you're counted as amongst a Mandalorian, and I think that is a very beautiful message you know that you're not just that by blood or by birth but by adapting something and that is that is a cool message so i'm not mad about the he had a different um okay well well i will happily that let that one uh rest there um i will give another a uh, quick shout out to the fact that this is a charity stream uh, if you're enjoying this if you have some money to spare um if you want to just make the world a little bit of a better place um here at christmas time um then the the way to do it we don't have any super chats on this one uh so everything you do you can donate rather than do a super chat uh that would be absolutely fantastic it's for world builders world builders is uh, patrick rothfuss's charity and that basically it's just about trying to support people to um uh, not just like get them out of a fix but actually kind of 
build people up, support the, them, them becoming sustainable ways of living uh, and, and to help educate people. So this is what it's about. It's not about going in over everyone's heads and saying, this is the right way to do stuff. It's about actually getting in there and working with local partners. So if you can at all afford, afford it, uh, you are enjoying the stream, then please uh, do, uh, if you like my vanishing jumper, if you like Helen's Wonder Woman costume or the, the rather random lightsaber, which appeared a while ago, uh, then please do. Um, that wasn't a cue for you to get it out again, Helen. Um, uh, <laughs> then, then please do uh, be generous and donate. Thank you very much. Um, Joyce and I should just say hi there. Good to see you in uh, in the chat. Uh, um, uh, for those who do not know, uh, Men of the West, West is uh, a fantastic Lord of the Rings channel um, and uh, sort of like the the uh, the granddaddy and OG of, of the um, Lord of the Rings YouTube channels, the one that we all look up to when we all sort of tip our hats to, to Yoiston uh, as being uh, the as a fine human being as well as having a great channel and being uh, sort of one of the first to, to do this kind of thing. Um, but let's go to uh, some... Uh, more questions about things that uh, Helen doesn't know anything about. So let's go to, um, although we can twist this around to something Helen might be able to talk about, is it Alejandro Martinez? Because I have, because oh, sorry, I have to... Do you have to go? Yeah, no, no, not now, but soon. So um, but okay. I'm sure you'll have another nice... Uh, I'll stay for a few more minutes, so maybe we can find something. Um, but if not, I'll just entertain the chat. Um, and yeah. Well, uh, well, I, I gave a very, very late uh, uh, shout out to people if they, they wanted to jump onto this. So I'm, uh, I'm hardly expecting it. I, I didn't know that Helen would be there sitting around in her Wonder Woman costume as she, uh, as she apparently always is. Uh, ready Casual to jump Thursday in Germany. Casual. Casual Thursday. Uh, so, um, uh, but uh, thank you, by the way, Helen, for coming on. I hugely appreciate it. Uh, but let's get, uh, let's go to a question from Alejandro saying, "Well, I've been." Well, I've enjoyed The Witcherverse on Netflix. Um, I hadn't really considered reading the books until last week's stream with Aziz and Kyle. Now I'm completely inspired. Well, I'm very happy about that. I love it when I can inspire people to be uh, to be reading the books. Um, my question for today is about A Song of Ice and Fire. In the spirit of the season, are there any holidays or days of special reverence in Planetos? I think I only recall reading about special occasions like weddings, coronations, name day celebrations and the like. Uh, so... Uh, this is a question which comes up, uh, I think, every time I do a Christmas live stream. Somebody somebody asks something, and, and I very rarely actually answer. I should know by now. I should research this one a lot more. But the, the short answer is that there is a mid midwinter. There are midwinter festivals, sort of across Westeros and also into Essos, very much um, uh, based on the the the, the, the midwinter idea. But the problem, obviously, with Planetos is that the seasons are a little bit odd so um they their midwinter is not necessarily mid winter when they have it but they do have a sort of a, a year uh, marking the turning of the year uh, festival um i was going to throw this to something helen might be able to answer what's what's your take i've got something i want to talk about the world of the witcher but in terms of uh, lord of the rings um we know Say Narnia clearly had Christmas. Um, is there any kind of um, Christmassy thing going on in in Middle Earth? Do you know? Um, no. Well, I mean, you know, we learn how golf was invented, right? Um, so <laughs> that is a super random thing he drops in there to make us, I don't know, to make us feel, you know, a, a little bit more at home. Now, um, we, I think in Numenor you do have a lot um, about these harvests. It, there is something like Thanksgiving, obviously not called Thanksgiving, um, when the king, you know, um, goes up to Menel Um, This is like the holy mountain of Numenor, and he thanks basically um, the gods um, and. And you, you have, you know, I, I think in the third age, I can't really think of, and the, the whole thing, you don't have libraries, you don't have universities, you don't have schools, you don't, you know, what, what, what school did Aragon go to? Like all these things are basically missing because it's a story about surviving and war, right? Um so Gandalf had to go, um, you know, to to um, to Gondor to find out about writings um, about the Ring and whatnot. So 
all these things are missing. And I don't remember in the third age any festivity. Do you? I don't. I remember the Numenor thing, but elsewise, yes. it's not. It's not mentioned. Uh, I think is no. the the short answer. You, you, I would agree. Yes, the the um, the Numenorian rituals. Uh, we, they, they had three in a year. I think they did. Yeah. They all trailed up to uh, the t top of the mountain. Um, but uh, no, in Third Age, we don't really hear huge amounts about anything um, other than that. Um, but I did want to talk very briefly in the world of the Witcher. This is something I've, I've been doing. Uh, research recently for a lot of Witcher videos, and one one thing which um, really struck me is one of the big um, mysteries in the world of the Witcher, and this is a deliberate mystery. It's something that has been left out. Um, the the years in the Witcher, we 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 hear about the years. The, we're in the year like twelve sixty or whatever, or, and I think a lot of people just assume, well, what's the base? Where's the year zero? And I think a lot of people assume this is the conjunction of the spheres because this is always mentioned as this big event, the conjunction of the spheres. But it's actually not. Um, th this year zero is something which is only mentioned in passing as the resurrection. And we do not know any more than that. And this is just something that, that is just put in there in the books. And this is the, it's just, uh, uh, is, there, is there some kind of Christ figure going on? We don't know. It doesn't seem to be mentioned anywhere. That doesn't seem to have had an impact on society in any way. Uh, but this, there clearly was some event which caused the uh, the calendar to be based from that moment of time that was even more important to whoever decided on this than the conjunction of the spheres. So um, we don't have an answer on that. There is, you can scour the internet. And I mean, if you do, then please put it in the chat. But we we definitely did not have, uh, we, we do not have a uh, an idea about what this might be. And it is a deliberate mystery. So um, perhaps mm -hmm. at some point, uh, the, the witch had... Uh, Maybe the spin-off when we're we're going to uh, see mm -hmm. uh, Blood Origin, which is going back in time uh, quite a few hundred years. Maybe that will give us some sort of a hint about what's going on there. Does it have to do anything with Laura Dawn and then her like breaking away? Or I, I don't think so. Um, not as far as time we're wise. aware. No, that okay. that seems to, that seems not to be when that was. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a bit of a mystery. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, okay, let's uh, have Anonymous. Thank you so much uh, for your donation. Uh, Maura um, Lee had posted uh, the question a few times now. Oh, has she? Um, oh, sorry, Maura. Yes. Hi, Maura. Um, so, in Deep Geek, for Helen, hi. Um, why, did <laughs> Saruman, why did Saruman go to the dark side? First of all, go Saruman. Um, yeah, K Kunitsky is uh, repeating it. Thank you. I love when people do that. So um, can I answer first? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> as, as, long as, you, as long as you reference why did my video called Why Did Saruman Turn Evil or whatever it was. But you can... Oh, you do can, you have... A, okay. I actually, um, have a, I actually have a video on this one, but I would love to hear your answer. Um, so go for it. No, I... So, first of all, um, I do, obviously, you need, again, me coming back to this point, um, he did because Tolkien wanted him to, because Tolkien wants to show us, you know, there's good and evil in this world. And why did, so there is an, oh, before Sauron, right, there was an OG evil dark lord, right, that was the master of Sauron. His name was Melkor Morgoth. Um, and, you know, he was once an angel, like all... Or, um, the other um, angels were, you know, and he um, got the, the, the things came into the world like jealousy, envy, and whatnot, and he personified that. So even him being a actually perfect being, you know, he 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 embodied that basically, right? So uh, Tolkien showed us. Um, you know that the, the the whole thing with with, with the um, with the um, um, Ainur uh, is basically, you know, the, 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 
the gen sorry it's very late the the genesis of the bible right so how the how the world came into being and i do think he mirrors this um in the um in in the um in the wizards as well right you can't you don't just have the perfect uh, wizards that aid that come to aid the world no right from the get go he gives you little hints that he was envious um that he actually was happy that he became the first of the wizards so he was the one leading the wizards then he was he got envious because he didn't get one of the elven rings and so there were little tiny hints um to 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 show um he he got corrupted over time right but i think the seed was already and this is my point of view and Tolkien doesn't say this specifically but i do think he was right from the get go this is what he was supposed to be and become and then this happened and this happened and you know made him more and more evil and corrupted him over time more and more um and i really do think it happened because he came to middle earth because in the undying lands that wouldn't have happened as fast right but in middle earth you know there are humans there is there is all this more god tainted the world more god tainted middle earth so it he got even more evil, to say it in these words, than he would um, be in, in the Undying Land. So that is my thought and my take on Saruman. I don't think something made him. I think he was made to be by the author. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I've got much to add to that other than watch my video. Uh, but you, <laughs> uh, the, the way that Tolkien puts it, um, and I don't know, the, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but the, the more that... Saruman studied evil, yeah. the law of the ring, the more it's turned from just wanting to understand it to wanting to have it. Um, and so it was, again, this is kind of like a talking does huge amounts of this show rather than tell thing. And it's almost that he, we, we can like hear him um, telling us about how if you spend all your time focusing in on and thinking about bad stuff, then actually then that's going to start framing how your mind is and what you actually want and think and are as a person. Um, I think the reverse of that is probably also true, is that the more that you uh, are thinking about good and positive things, then that is probably also going to be, and surround yourself with good and positive people, then that is also going to uh, affect and, and mould and shape your, your character. So, uh, yeah, I think there's, there's a huge element of that going on. Yeah, but he also tells you, you know, it, it blinds you if you just, you know, surround yourself just with the good people. And this is, you know, again, talking about Star Wars, this is, you know, why the Jedi Council didn't see evil arising, right? They also, in a way, became arrogant and they didn't see this. And this is what also happened to the elves and to, to Gandalf and all these people. They didn't, they didn't see it coming. So you just can't surround yourself and just learn what one thing you have to see you know the whole world what the, the world as a whole so with good and evil and you have to accept that to you know in the end uh, beat it yeah agreed um andrew k in the chat saying haven't read the books and don't want to spoil a potential future video but can you explain the wild hunt in more detail i will definitely be explaining that i've uh, uh, I've just finished doing a video about the Wild Hunt, as it happens, uh, and uh, that's going to... Uh, I'm never sure when over Christmas to upload videos, because I think, do people actually watch them on Christmas Day? So I think that's coming out like maybe a couple of days after Christmas. Uh, I, I put that one down, so um, I won't sort of do spoilers uh, for that here, but if you do want to know about the Wild Hunt, then there's a video coming out very soon. Um, let's go to another question that Helen doesn't care about. Um, let's, uh, the Gift of Mercy saying, hi, Robert, and greetings from Sweden. Hello, Sweden. Uh, I'm a new patron and very much looking forward to immersing myself in the community. Well, you're very welcome. Um, shout out to all the moderators for your valuable work. I've not done that yet. Moderators, thank you. You are amazing. I'm grateful, particularly at this time of year, as you look back over the year, you have been mainstays of this community. So thank you for all your wonderful work going on. If you are watching this live, please do just uh, show a little bit of love to the moderators because they are fantastic. 
The question is, what do you envision for Arya in The Winds of Winter? Will it be similar to what happened in the show with the phrase and Littlefinger uh, and all the rest of it? Um, I'm myself leaning towards her taking a less public role and rather influencing the story from behind the curtains like the faceless men. Will she join in there plotting against the dragons? Um, OK, so uh, my take on where Arya is, is um, we, we know a little bit already about it because we've had one of the pre-release chapters from the Winds of Winter. They're not set in stone, these pre-release chapters. They um, they could change, but uh, I get the feeling that one probably won't change much if it does. Um, the, that first chapter, Aya, is still there in Bravos, and she's there. Um, she's in a theatre troupe, basically, and it's, there's echoes of what we saw on the TV show. She finds someone who's on her list, who's ran randomly there over from Westeros, and she kills him, basically. And this is yet more evidence that Arya is um, not really embracing the no one thing. She's still Stark inside. She's still Arya inside. So, um, we're going to stay in Windsor Winter. She's going to start off being in Bravos, but that will not uh, last for very long. Um, she, with the faceless men, that is very distracting. Whatever you're doing there with those lights, Helen, have you got anyway? It doesn't matter. I will carry on talking about Aya. Um, so, uh, Aya will come across, I suspect, to Westeros during the course of the book. Um, she will split from the faceless men. I think that the way this is going to work is that they are going to be happy for her to go, whether they say this or not, for the simple reason that who is it that they want dead? If you take the bigger picture on what their beliefs are, I've done a whole series of videos on this, so I'm not going to go into all of the detail, but they are not just like a set of assassins with cool catchphrases they are actually a religious cult and they fundamentally believe that all men must die everyone must die what goes against that what is the biggest heresy people not dying people the undead people being brought back and where is this happening well it's happening all over the place but one of the places that this is happening is in king's landing uh with the the zombie mountain and so the fact that they know if they release Arya back out into the world who's she going to be killing well the the mountains on her list cersei's on her list she's just get she's going to go and do what they want anyway so i think that is where it's going to end up for Arya. Uh, will she do the same things she did on the show? Um, I think the one thing that probably, and it was a very small moment, but I thought it was a really good moment on the show, which they will get is this moment of decision. She went to the inn of the crossroads. You remember she met Hot Pie randomly and she was there. And then he says, oh, did you know that John is now back and around? He's at Winterfell. And it was like, she goes out, sits on a horse and she like sits there at the crossroads and the, where am I going? Am I going south to try and kill Cersei? Am I going north to go and see John? And she decides to go north. And I think that decision point will definitely be in the books. Um, and then she will come back down south later to finish off her list. So I think that's going to be there. I think that the killing the phrase, um, actually, that's not her main thing. Uh, her main thing is the Lannisters who have been doing all of these horrible things. That's what she witnessed. That's what she knows about. The phrase, if anyone's going to be getting the phrase, the people who've got the huge thing against the phrase are Lady Stoneheart and also Nymeria and the Wolf Pack. So that's, I think, that is where the, the phrase downfall is going to be coming from. The Wolf Pack, incidentally, have already been killing phrase. Uh, and Lady Stoneheart, we know, is trying to... Um, uh, trying to get revenge on the phrase. So I think that's how things are going to end up. But I, uh, starting off in Bravos, coming across to Westeros, deciding do I go south first or do I go north, deciding to go north. That, I think, very broadly speaking, is her um, uh, character arc during the season. Uh, Helen, uh, you've probably been reading the chat and playing with the lightsaber. What's what's going on in the chat? Nothing. Nothing is going on in the chat. I, I don't believe that for one second. Are you just zoning out? Um, okay, let's. Uh, well, I will have a quick look in the chat. Um, uh, so, uh, Jackie C saying, Siri's got eyebrows now. Not quite sure what that's about. Is uh, Did she not have eyebrows in season one? They were um, very light and now they're dark. This is a thing women 
see. This is a thing, is it? Okay, all right. Well, there, there we go. So she's got eyebrows now. Uh, cloaked one saying, yeah, why do folks hate the phrase? Um, good question. I'm not entirely sure. They always seem so nice. Um, uh, Sasa K saying, cat will kill the phrase. Yes, I think I would agree with that. Um, uh, <laughs> Cluedus Fangirl confirming this is Palpatine's saber. That makes... Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's me roughly. So Lady Pushkin saying, what would my cosplay be? I'm not sure that I know, but thank you very much for your uh, your donation. I hugely appreciate uh, that. Um, Something boring. What's that? What would, what would your cosplay <laughs> be? Don't, and don't say Wonder Woman. Okay, so next one, but we need we seriously need more donations for that. I still have the Leia costume, you know, the Leia Jabba slave costume. So that will come out wow. next year when you know people. Wow! So next year, if you, I mean, I feel a little bit dirty even saying this, but if you wish to see, <laughs> if you wish to see Helen in a, a princess and you will Leia come costume, as, you will you will come as. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, let's say Han Solo. Yes. Um, good, he's good clearly the best character in, in Star Wars, uh, and I will have any no no uh, discussion on that mo at all. Oscar the Westerman uh, say or asking, does the One Ring actually have any real power for anyone other than Sauron? Uh, Helen, you like talking about evil. Why don't you tell us about the One Ring? <laughs> Um, yes, so I do, I personally do think, and again, this is uh, Tolkien not saying that is um, the fact, I do think things in Tolkien's world, there are swords that speak, um, there is, um, obviously, I, I do think the Zimmerils are sentient, and I do think the One Ring also is sentient. So basically, in every century, we have a thing that is sentient. Um, and I do think, yes, the ring has a life of its own. And the ring definitely wants to go back um, to um, to Sauron. And he tries everything um, to um, when he sees the opportunity to escape Gollum and the bloody cave, because, you know, there's, there's nothing there. Um, he um, takes that opportunity the ring and he obviously when Tolkien wrote it you know the Hobbit was a standalone thing at that time but he changed things so um, yes I do think the ring is sentient wants to go back to Sauron and not just influence as the people but has a, a life um, of its own and I find that fascinating there are more objects um, like that in Tolkien's world and that's really that's a cool magical but also very mythological we have that like there are many i wrote a very very long video which i never will publish because it's too long about um, magic rings and there's basically there's a ring of geek which is a, a uh, ancient um, ring in i think it's mesopotamia um and there are many stories of magic rings um before Tolkien wrote it and it's it's really cool so i do think that ring you know has a life of its own it does. And the way that Tolkien talks about it is that Sauron poured himself into the, the One Ring. So it's, uh, I mean, in sort of more modern language, if you think of it as being like a Horcrux from Harry Potter, that's the kind of feel. Um, obviously, J.K. Rowling stole the idea from Tolkien rather than the other way around. But that's the kind of idea is that it's not just like a magical ring that he made. He poured himself into it. So uh, this is actually, it's got lots of Sauron and Sauron's power within it. Um, and if you want to ever see its powers, then yes, obviously we know it can turn people invisible. Uh, but also there, there's some fantastic... Uh, moments when uh, if you read the books when Sam has the ring and you just see and he's he's wearing it and you actually see how people react to him you mm -hmm. see uh, he does suddenly appear much mightier and people are scared uh, it's it clearly has strong powers in and of itself so yes it does um, and uh, it's um, it's one of those things though a lot of Tolkien's magical items, it's quite hard to write just this list. 
it's not like a Dungeons and Dragons. Like this gives you a plus five to whatever. It's no. it, you. You have to sort of read between the lines, see the effect it has on other people. For mm -hmm. example, Gandalf's ring. You will find what we're, we're told. This sort of inspires courage and hope in Gandalf and those around him. That's not the kind of thing that you just like suddenly. You know, oh, I'm suddenly feeling full of courage and hope. But then when yeah. you read through the story with that lens thinking you know what what's going on here you actually see the moment gandalf's gone suddenly the 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 fellowship fall apart they losing so much hope uh, when you see gandalf at minas tirith you actually see he's riding along and the soldiers there the gondorian soldiers they suddenly when they see him they get you know uh, filled with courage and, and willing to go into battle whereas before they were a lot more depressed so you see the effects of it rather than it being like a, a spell so to speak yeah and i love you know that sauron learned from the failings of his master because there's a wonderful book out there it's called morgod's ring and this is what his master did because you said he poured you know his part of his life energy and his malice and whatnot into the the ring into when he forged the ring but his master originally poured all his life energy obviously he was way more powerful he was a higher angelic spirit so to say um but he poured all his life energy in the lands in middle earth um and so he did that was a big mistake because then you know you, you power gets lost right if if you spread your power very wide obviously you know it's different than having it in a teeny tiny object which you can carry around and it's like a magnum you know like a magnifying glass so i like the idea Tolkien, you know Sauron learned from um, Merkur's mistake and then created the ring, but he created it in Mount Doom, where it is said the malice and energy of Merkur, who created um, Mount Doom, um, is still at its highest, basically, or still there, which is really cool. I thought you said Merkel's mistake, which is uh, which is taking us into German politics. No, she's got, it. she's gone. <laughs> she got, she gone. She, she's gone now. Um, uh, <laughs> let's uh, the linking across to this though. We did uh, Karl Kosnock saying, asking what the source of evil is in Middle Earth. If Iluvatar was all good, that this is uh, this is a fantastic uh, question. Uh, did you want to go off on? No, you, you. Uh, I will happily do this. So this. Um, is something where yes Iluvatar is he's the sort of the god uh, figure he is good um, and he creates the first thing that we're told that he creates are uh, the the Aina the big spiritual beings that we've got and um, the they sing we get the music of the Aina, and this is quite a, a theme which goes through a lot of different uh, sort of magical world creation is this song that goes out um, and they sing effectively they sing into creation uh, the world and the universe and, and all the rest of it and there is though within this there is a discordant note a discordant bit of singing somebody who's not quite singing what they should be doing is actually uh, singing their own uh, thoughts, desires, and that is Melkor Morgoth, and he does this the first time, and and Luvatar goes, ah, just okay, let's try again, and then the second time, and Luvatar goes, well, you really shouldn't be doing that, but then they sort of carry on, and then the third time, it's just like, no, that's it, stop it now. Uh, but what happens is that that discordant music, that uh, bit of the music that is not according to the initial idea and plan that is there, that becomes a part of creation. But we get the twist that Aru Luvatar then says, but you know what? It doesn't actually matter. Because if people try to do this, if they try to make bad things evil if they try and twist things for their own benefit actually that's part of the bigger song that's part of the bigger act of creation that lewis i suspect c.s lewis would call it the deeper magic uh this is that this is the where this goes and so evil will be used to create good so that's where evil comes from from the, the melkor morgoth this sort of like renegade um uh, Valar, effectively, that's that's who he is, and the greatest and most powerful of them. 
And and I do think, you know, like if you I'm into Greek mythology, right? And the 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 Greek gods they are always like, you know, they don't want to be forgotten. They don't want the people to forget about them. They want them to sing the sing you know, to sing the songs and to praise them and tell stories about them because that is how they stay alive, right? And I do think this is a teeny tiny bit um what Tolkien also wanted to give a rule, right? Um because a ru- so if if you don't know evil obviously you know you don't go to the church and pray right um and it, it goes obviously hand in hand uh what, what you said but i i do think this also um is a big thing so god does want to be remembered right um and and people worshiping him so if there's no evil there's no re- mostly no reason right to be grateful for things and to to ask god for for aid and whatnot so i think it was also god that wanted that and a bit of entertainment obviously <laughs> yes, God is just wanting entertainment. That's what Tolkien was saying. Um, uh, the real YT <laughs> saying, I know that's not what you were saying. I apologize. Apologize. Um, real YT saying, can we still donate after the stream? Yes, you can. I will leave this open so people can donate. Um, uh, we've got uh, 20 minutes until um, we will do the first cutoff for the prizes and, and the, the first a couple of prizes are um, $25 to be spending in my shop and also a painting by the exceptionally talented uh, Timbo Took. Uh, so if you would like uh, to uh, to get your hands on either of those things, then now is the time to donate. Uh, and thank you very much to Anonymous uh, for your donation and another Anonymous. And I think I saw one more. Chaos Ballerina, thank you so much. Very generous. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, and also another one from uh, Anonymous. Um, I think that's that's it. Um, oh, question. You can answer this one. Um, uh, this is Jasper Furness saying, uh, is this symbolic of Tom Bombadil singing happily? It shows his power. So what's, what do you think is uh, going on? Uh, explain Tom Bombadil to, to us. Oh, God, not again. <laughs> this, is, this, is, I, 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 this is something I... that everybody <laughs> asks. And it, no. I completely understand this because he is this oh. wonderfully anachronistic figure within the universe. Um, so, um, I like Goldberry you... more, you know, like a mischievous nymph. Um, if you know how they met, this is really cool. So Tom Bombadil's wife, she tried to drown him by grabbing him by the beard, um, and drowning him in a river and he told her off. Um, so, you know, some people can relate to that and, uh, yeah, I really like the story how they met. So I like the mischievous nature nymph more than him. No. Who's Tom Bombadil? Do you want to start? <laughs> Come uh, well, on, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, I mean, I think in, in relation to this, the idea with the singing, I think, is really important. Tom Bombadil definitely, <laughs> uh, Tolkien was never clear or specific about this. He just said he was he was a character he felt was important. He reflected something he thought was important about the world. Um, so he didn't give us this clear uh, description of who or what Tom Bombadil was. But he he was there at the beginning he will be there at the end of the world he's clearly very connected in with the world um and he is in some ways a kind of a representational manifestation of creation and the singing does reflect this i think this is something i'm almost everybody uh, scholars, scholars would all agree on uh, with this is that he sings all the time that's what he's about he sings very silly songs um and uh this is how he gets people to it shows his power by singing he he manages to get rid of the um uh, or, or he may, he basically he tells the old man willow to let the hobbits go uh he's singing there he's singing when they caught in get caught in the barrow getting the barrow white going it's it's songs what does it and this is how his power works and so it's clearly an echo of the song that made the world in some way and he is an expression of this in some way and that is shown through his singing mm-hmm 
Okay, so uh -huh. I have something negative to, to add to this because I actually don't like and I never fully loved that character because I do think his 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 world so, so how he looks at the world and being basically like you know oh whatever I'll just do my my stupid singing and I'll just hang here with my pretty wife and I do I, I I don't like that I don't like that he's not concerned about the fate of the world although he knows everything or he could know right Gandalf at the end of the Lord of the Rings he goes there and tells him everything he 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 could know and he could be involved and I don't in a way I understand the character and everything and I agree with what you said but in a way I don't like that attitude I don't like this is why you know sometimes with the hobbits I'm a bit mad like come on do something I'm I'm a doer I'm a warrior right so I for me this is very because he had the ability but he just doesn't care and I don't like that I mean I understand but I think that he is that's deliberate he is there I think I as an expression of being I not know, doing I know. which no, is something that Tolkien I think thought was very important it's not always yes. just about doing the thing and and it's it's no. when Gandalf at the end of it they're heading back towards the Shire and he goes to talk to Tom Bombadil and it's it's he said I'd never we, we'd never would have anything to talk about before and it's like well why on earth wouldn't you have anything to talk about you're interesting people and it's because he was that's what Gandalf he had a mission he had a purpose for what he was doing whereas Tom Bombadil what do we hear about him doing he's just singing and having fun he's collecting flowers he's he's going uh and to have some some drinks and nice food with uh with farmer maggot he's, he's he's just enjoying the world he's enjoying who he is where he is and and and, and therefore he doesn't actually it's not about doing thing. no it's i get that being. but you have somebody like you know fatty borger or all these people you know the deeds of the little people they don't play an important role but they do play a role and they know you know when their time has come they do their little deeds right and he i don't know but that that is just me i mean shame me in the in the chat please uh, for that I, I but i never I don't think there's a need to shame you i think this is a, he's <laughs> not a, i think that the, the way that i see it is he's not a character he is no. an expression of something. And yes. if he were a character who were there deliberately uh, ignoring the things that have to be done, then yes, I would agree. But I think that he's not. He's an expression yeah. of something, which means that yeah, he's not, no. that's, he's, he's not a, a character that we should be expecting to be doing anything because he's not there to do things. He's there to be. Um, Mr. E. Knight, thank you very much for uh, your donation. Um. Let's go to uh, question. I have to, I have, I have to have go, to go. Now. Yeah. Excellent. Well, this is a chance for us to, not excellent that you have to go, but it's a chance for me to talk about something <laughs> like fire like, for a little while. Finally, get rid um, of this uh, woman. Helen, thank you so much for coming along. Um, it, it was, as I say, it was incredibly last minute when I just randomly asked a few people if they were free. Uh, and so thank you very much for, for being here. Um, do you want to just let people know where they can find you? Somebody asked, is this the clueless girl? Yes, indeed, this <laughs> is the clueless girl. Uh, she has a, the clueless, clueless fan girl is, is Helen's um, YouTube channel. Do you want to tell people where they can find you? Well, yes, under the Clueless Fan Girl, I do um, a lot of the ring videos, um, mainly first and second and whatnot ages. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely cover the show and I'm getting more into the, the show content at the moment. I do have a big, big Elven and Numenor playlist. I like to roll the R's. And uh, yeah, uh, on casual Thursdays, I dress up as Wonder Woman and whatnot <laughs> next year, you know, you will find out <laughs> as what I'll come next year. And it, it was so nice. So thank you for the invite, Robert. I think last year it was a few of us and it, it was also a, a lot of fun. So please, people support this um, really good charity. Robert uh, sometimes um, does these streams and I really enjoy, you know, that content creators give back with a big platform. So Thank you to you, Robert, as well, and everybody in the chat. Uh, yeah, and Merry Christmas. Uh, 
very Christmas spirity here. And I hope everybody gets uh, good into the new year and we'll have an epic good time in 2022. Bye bye. Bye, Helen. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. You have a very happy Christmas as well. And she's gone. Uh, okay, so uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, it was rather an extended cameo there from, from Helen. She's, uh, as I say, she's got huge amounts of knowledge about um, uh, Lord of the Rings as well as uh, things like Star Wars. So if, if you like that, then please do go and check out her channel. Um, uh, let's uh, go to, I said I was going to talk uh, about some um, Song of Ice and Fire things, but we are 10 minutes away from the cutoff for the first draw for these uh, excellent prizes. Joel Faulkner, thank you so much for uh, your uh, donation. The way we're going to do this, uh, Reflective Rambling, if you could, uh, I think you've been keeping a track of everybody who's been uh, donating, um, put them all into a big hat pull out uh, um, uh, a couple of names and send them through to me over on Twitter and then I will announce uh, who gets the first couple of prizes. If we can, I think we've just actually just got it. Uh, Mara Lee, thank you so much. Uh, just taking us over, very kind, it's taking us over 800. Um, I'd love to make it to 1,000. You know, I think that'd be uh, pretty amazing if we can do that. Um, so uh, let's go to, uh, well, that's going on. Let's go to a couple of questions um, about A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, uh, Lawn Duck 20 saying, <coughs> pardon me, saying, when Jamie attempts to get the blackfish to surrender and take the black, this is when uh, the blackfish is at River Run and Jamie is working his way through the Riverlands and he is taking back the castles um, and they're having this sort of conversation. Um, he um, tells him that Ned Stark's bastard is Lord Commander of the Wall. And Brynden responds that Cat never trusted John Northion, and she was apparently correct about them both. I've never understood this. Why does he think she was correct about John? What did John ever do for, for him to say such a thing? He knows Ned to be an honourable honorable man, but apparently just because Cat says she doesn't trust John, he automatically thinks bad of him and compares him to Theon. This has been driving me crazy for years. Help me understand. Um, so uh, I will just quickly read out the quote. So this is um, Jamie first, basically uh, shouting up at the blackfish. And he says, I will permit you to take the black, I'm trying to persuade him here to uh, to sort of give up the castle. He says, I will permit you to take the black. Ned Stark's bastard is the Lord Commander on the wall. The, black ship, uh, the blackfish narrowed his eyes. Did your father arrange for that as well? Catelyn never trusted the boy, as I recall, no more than she ever trusted Theon Greyjoy. It would seem she was right about them both. No, sir, I think not. I'll die warm, if you please, with a sword in hand running red with lion blood. So um, what's going on here? Why why does Black, Blackfish not like John? Well, the first thing to say is that they've not met. Uh, so this isn't a this isn't a personal dislike of John. The only information he has is from Cat, his niece, uh, who, as we know, did not really like John. Uh, and uh, so he's not been talking to her a huge amount. They, they they were together for a while during the time of the story, uh, but it's not like over many many years that he's been able to sort of gauge her opinion on lots of different subjects but he does know that she didn't ever really trust Theon and she was right about that and he does know that she never really trusted John so there's a familial reason he, this is family this is him just trusting the good judgment of of a member of his family and but there's also another bit which is this is um this is bravado. This is smack talk. This is uh, this is the blackfish. Uh, he's he's never going to say, oh, actually, what? So Ned Stark's bastard is is in charge of the wall. I'll I'll go up there now. That's he's never going to do that. That was never on the uh, on the cards. Never an option for him. Um, so what uh, what we've got is a situation where whatever Jamie says to him, he's just going to say no. Nah. No, this isn't. Uh, I'm. I'm not doing that. Uh, so um, he's trying to. Uh, 
Well, the other element, I think, is the fact that he also has no reason to trust Jamie Lannister or the Lannisters as a whole for what happened uh, with the Red Wedding. When Jamie suggests something to him, then obviously the Blackfish is going to go, actually, I don't think I trust you. Why, why, why would you want me to do this? What's your plan? What's the hidden agenda behind this? Uh, so that's uh, that's what I think is going on there. Uh, Glenn Thrasher, thank you very much for your uh, uh, donation. Um, and um, another from Anonymous Smarali saying, in honor for Dan, the gorgeous boy. Well, thank you, Dan. I uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Dan, my dog, is very much in favor of charitable donations. Um, Anonymous, again, thank you very much. Carl Karsnark saying, next year Robert is going to have an actual sweater with that Geralt pose on it. Uh, well, so here's one. I could do that. Yeah, that could work. Um, maybe not. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to take suggestions for next year's uh, Christmas sweater or Christmas jumper. Um, question. Erin um, M., thank you so much for your donation. Um, and Kayla Richardson as well. Thank you so much. Um, Mara Lee, thank you. Um, I think that's me caught up on the donations. Um, so Oscar, the Westerman saying, I have noticed a few parallels between Cersei and the Wicked Witch of the West from Oz. Will Cersei employ dark magic with her future king, Euron, and is Brienne small town Dorothy? Um, I'm not sure about all of those parallels. Cersei, will she um, employ dark magic with her future king, Euron? I think it's probably more the other way around, to be honest. She's not the magical one, Euron is the magical one. So he is the one that you need to be keeping your eye out for. Um, uh, there, there, there will be some kind of dark Lovecraftian horror outcome for, for that matchup. I'm absolutely sure about that. Uh, all of Euron's nightmarish visions, he's going to be trying to bring about. He wants to destroy the world. He wants to become god that's what euron is trying to achieve so um it is him who's doing that we will get the uh, the science magic if we can call it that from kyburn which is going to be in cersei's corner uh, so that she will be bringing some magic into the equation but it's mostly going to be euron um reflective rambling saying how much do we need to raise before we get a pick with dan with a santa hat on or around his person well uh oh i don't know how much we need to raise well let's what are we on 891 um if if we hit how have we got in the next five minutes if we can do before the cutoff if we can get to a thousand, then over on Instagram before the end of the year, I will put a picture of Dan with a Santa hat on there. So if you want to see that, uh, please do donate now. Devyani saying, uh, uh, or not saying, but donating. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and just saying uh, thank you for all your hard work this year. Um, sending warm wishes to the IDG community. Uh, Mara Lee, again, thank you very much. Um, um let's uh have a look i've got a question from mike mcfly saying if all direwolves were still alive which one is the toughest and most vicious i'm thinking either ghost or nymeria i'm going with ghost you have to always watch out for the quiet ones yeah it's um i don't know about vicious they, they both they definitely are both um quite strong and powerful nymeria has uh, a super pack at her back um, and has been fending for herself all this time. So if you say that they all start at the same base point, Nymeria has had the most experience in uh, sort of combat situations, I would say. So yes, let's go with uh, Nymeria for, uh, for that. But Ghost, I think the thing with Ghost is that... Uh, Ghost almost certainly has had Bloodraven uh, warging into him for uh, on and off for a very long time. So we're not just seeing Ghost on his own. We're seeing Ghost with uh, Bloodraven um, there as well. Um, 
Oh, wow. We had a sudden spate of donations. Thank you so much. We've had um, uh, Anonymous. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and another one from Anonymous and another one from Anonymous. And I think that has taken us over a thousand. And uh, Persephone, thank you so much. Uh, so we've got a thousand. So yes, at a thousand, uh, I promised that we would have Dan on Instagram with a Santa hat on or about his person. I'm not sure whether he'll be particularly pleased with the idea of having a Santa hat on him, but I'm sure that he would be okay with having it around him. Um, so uh, there we go. I think with that, we will do the cut off reflective rambling if you could do the honors now there are more do not stop donating because there are more uh, uh more prizes to come there is i'm leaving this open for as long as you want um, if you're enjoying this please do donate anonymous thank you very much uh, but if we can make the cut off and if uh if reflective rambling you could give me a couple of names from your magic draw and and i will um allocate out the the first couple of prizes thank you very much um, Andrew K saying, Ghost is probably the least vicious in terms of his temperament. He is the smart, quiet one. Shaggy Dog seems very wild from Grey Wind and Nymeria. Um, yes, yeah, so Shaggy Dog definitely very wild, but I think, don't think Shaggy Dog's got very long for this world either, um, like uh, Rickon. Um, let's go to... Um, Yes, that's the case thing. Summer was the first to kill someone, though. So there is that. Yes, uh, absolutely. And Grey Wind, when he was around, clearly was very effective. He was causing huge amounts of terror in opponents in the wars that he was in. Um, let's go to a question. Um, I think this was also from Lawndark20 saying, do you think Bloodraven knows that Bran's skin changes into Hodor? This is an interesting question because um, Bran thinks not. Bran thinks that nobody knows this. He We, we get a little bit from his POV where he's thinking, um, no one knows I do, I do this. I, I just go into Hodor's mind and then no one knows it's me doing it. Uh, so he thinks not. But there is this curious moment when uh, Summer, he's he's in Summer, and he comes across a wolf that has somebody warging into it. Varamir's six skins, one of Varamir's wolves. And they have a bit of a fight. Uh, but Bran can look into the eyes of that wolf and he just goes, a walk. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a, that's a walk in there. And that tells us that you can tell green seers wolves can tell that that animal is being controlled by someone so given the fact that we have blood raven who is immensely powerful uh, it, it makes sense that he would know or realize that that's what's happening with bran and hodor so um whether he's consciously done that, because Blood Raven does seem to be sort of like zoning in and out of like being there or being uh, hooked up to the Weirwood Network. So whether he sort of consciously clocked that, we don't know. Uh, but it makes sense that he does know. He has found out. Um, right. Let's go to a question from... Um, mm -mm. so this was about, oh, this is from uh, Jutarista, uh, again saying, um, thank you for recommending A Night of the Seven Kingdoms audiobook narrated by Harry Lloyd. It was a lot of fun to listen to, as first I listened to the version in my own language and I didn't enjoy the reader's interpretation. Well, you're very welcome. It's it's something that I uh, often recommend to people if they like audiobooks in, and I don't get any commission from this or anything at all. So this is a pure recommendation uh, of uh, just uh, the the best, and I don't say this lightly, the best audiobook match of narrator to the story that I've 
I've heard uh, Harry Lloyd doing um, the Knight of the Seven Kingdoms, the Duncan Egg stories. He does a fantastic job. He's He plays, if you don't know him, uh, he plays uh, Viserys on the show. So he was obviously only there for a, a few episodes, but he just absolutely captures uh, not just the, the sort of the Targaryen arrogance of some characters, but but dunk just perfectly in just the way that he thinks uh, that just makes you love the character as much as you uh, as you think you should do because he's such an amazing character. But anyway, uh, question was uh, about thoughts on Jaffa Flowers and Othor's attack on the Lord Commander and the First Ranger. When I first read the story, I had uh, the assumption that the others tar were targeting leaders of the Night's Watch. But on, upon learning of Blood Raven's existence and that Ghost is very likely skin changed by him, I changed my mind. Now I think that Othor and Jaffa were somehow animated by Blood Raven to provoke the Great Ranging, as Ghost was present on finding the bodies and then alarmed John about the attack. A first ranger is a very unstable job, but there was no other targeted attempts by others on Lord Commander, Steward, First Builder, or Maester. Amen. Okay, so um, I like the thinking on this, uh, but personally, I think that this is an Occam's Razor thing. That uh, the you'll remember the situation: the two members of the Night's Watch, the dead bodies that were found, and uh, they were sort of found north of the wall brought back into Castle Black. They became animated as whites. They attacked, you'll remember the attack on Lord Commander Mormont, because that's the one that Ghost and John uh, uh, played a part in saving. The other one, Jaffa, he made um, he made a beeline for, um, and I've forgotten his name now, uh, the, uh, can't remember uh but but he he made he made a beeline for one of the other leaders of the night's watch now could that have been blood raven deliberately trying to prompt uh the first uh, a great ranging getting everybody north of the wall well it could but i think that that could have happened without deliberately targeting leaders um as for the question of whether there was any other targeting of leaders well Yes, there was. So uh, the, the the two bodies, Othor and Jaffa Flowers, they were part of Benjamin's ranging party that went north. Uh, so actually the fact that they had been got by the, uh, the White Walkers, by the others, shows that this was an attack on uh, Benjamin upon the first ranger. So there was one there. Then we get and the, the two people who were targeted in Castle Black were both part of the leadership. Um, and then, obviously, when they all do go on the Great Ranging, who gets attacked north of the wall? Well, all of them do, but you will find that, obviously, Lord Mormont was there. They were, they were targeting the Night's Watch. So, yes... Uh, I, I understand the logic. I think that Blood Raven did want them to go north of the wall, but he was trying to show them things. He was trying to show them the uh, the bodies that were then going to become the whites, uh, and he was then trying to save the situation. He was trying to save Lord Commander Mormont, and he was trying to get John involved. That all adds up, as far as I'm concerned. It's possible. It's possible that there was there was uh, another level to this, but. I don't think it's necessary for the uh, for the plot to work. Um, uh, okay, so uh, I think we have got um, yes, we've got our first winners. Um, so then we've got um, thank you very much, Reflective Rambling, for uh, finding some some winners for us. This was uh, entirely <laughs> random. I have been assured. I have screen caps if proof is needed. I, I'm told. Uh, so um, we have got uh, the first uh, the first prize that we are giving out is. Let me just go to see what the first thing I was said was going to do. Uh, the Timbo Took painting. Uh, this is an excellent prize to be uh, to be had, uh, and that. Uh, that one is going to go to, drumroll please, Taryn. Uh, so Taryn, congratulations. Uh, feel free to get in contact uh, with me in any of the many ways. Um, or uh, you, 
email, Twitter, wherever, uh, or just put a comment down after this, uh, and then I will arrange uh, for uh, Timbo to be uh, sorting out that picture for you. Uh, the second as uh, is uh, Mara Lee. Thank you very much, Mara. Um, and uh, Mara, you get, um, I think it was $25 for my shop. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I think you picked three out. I think I've only got two prizes to give out, Reflective Rambling, on this one. But the, we've got three prizes for the second um, uh, part of this, which means everything from now on... Uh, I'll carry on until we run out of questions, but also and all the way up until the new year, uh, if you if you donate on this video, I don't think it shows it up. But if you just put uh, down in the I can see when people have, have donated without getting the exact name. But if you put down in the comments beneath the video, if you're watching this and want to donate, uh, if you just put a little comment in there that says something nice about the moderators, then I'll know that was one, that was uh, that was you. So uh, we've got three prizes to go uh, for the second part of this giveaway. Uh, the first one is another twenty-five dollars to spend in my shop. A second is twenty dollars for um, Friday tea, which is fandom themed teas, and twenty-five dollars for San. Vixian's shop with some art, some more excellent um, uh, artwork. Um, uh, so thank you very much. And I think Cloaked One was also uh, helping keep track of the list. So uh, thank you very much, moderators. You, as always, do an excellent job. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. And congratulations to those who uh, won the prizes. Um, uh, oh yes, yeah, so the third one is in case someone opts out because of shipping or location. So there we go. We've got I've got a I've got a runner up that I will announce if that is the case. But uh, congratulations to Taryn and to Mara Lee. Um, uh, normal Mr. Nice Guy, uh, thank you very much for your uh, donation. Also uh, Vilma Kanta, um, thank you. Um, and I think that's me caught up on the donations. So if you want at the moment, we've only got two donations for three presents. So if you think if you want a good chance uh, of one of those, uh, one of those prizes, now is a good time to be uh, doing another donation. Um, OK, let's um, let's go to um, another question. What uh, what more should we do? I had a question about. Um, uh, oh, so Remy Sparkle Muffin saying, Seasons, greetings, and to you. I have a question about a shy. Given that in A Song of Ice and Fire, tales of faraway lands are often exaggerated or otherwise unreliable, is it possible that a shy is a normal or pleasant place to live, but everyone who has been there lies about it to maintain the legend? Well, it's possible, is the, the short answer, but I don't think it's... I don't think it's likely. It, we, we don't have many people who have been there, um, but um, there, there's, there, there are some. And th but the fact that we have got named people uh, who have been there, people like Marwin the Mage um, has been there, for example. Um, obviously, we've got um, a Quaith who's come from there, um, Melisandre who has... The moment you start getting a few of Midi Mazda, the moment you start getting a few people who have been there, you start to have to create quite a conspiracy, I think. Uh, and added to which, people from Ashai do come into uh, all the way up as far as Vaistothrak, which is this kind of like meeting place in the, in the middle of the continent. Um, two markets, a western market and an eastern market. Lots of people, yes, not many people go to Ashai, but lots of people do uh and in the grand scheme of things and i think the fact that we've had no one say actually you know what it's a bit exaggerated uh does seem to suggest again occam's razor seems to suggest it probably is like we hear uh, for uh the donation um, a cupcake saying, just thought, saw that you're alive, and I'm laughing a lot over the half blended in Christmas sweater. Well, you're you're welcome. This was it is um, intentional is probably the wrong way of saying it, but having having seen that that was what was happening, I've just decided to go with it. Um, uh, so thank you very much. Um, question from. Um, 
Catherine Furseth uh, saying, Hi, Robert, wishing you and Dan a very happy Christmas. Thank you for all your hard work this past year, bringing joy to so many. You're very welcome. Um, if green seeing through the Weirwood Network works as we think, and a person needs to know what and when to look for a specific piece of information and knowledge in order to find it, why can't Blood Raven or the Children of the Forest just look back to see how the others were defeated during the long, the first long night? Maybe Bran will see the one who does this, meaning he is more powerful than uh, will be the one who does this, meaning he's more powerful than Blood Raven. Does this tie in somehow with the North remembers, even though clearly they do not? Um, what do you think? Well, there's no reason to say that they have not done this, but we only know that Bran has not done this, and Bran's not really been there all that long um he's only gone through the weir the weirwood network back in time um intentionally just in this one chapter when first of all he goes and talks to her his father or sees his father uh, and then he sort of looks through the weirwood tree in winterfell going back through time so we've not actually had huge amounts there we do not know anything about what blood raven has been up to all this time um and i think it's fair to say that the children of the forest know what's hap what happened, what caused the first long night. They just haven't told anyone. And Bran is not asking those kinds of questions because at the moment that's not really where he's at. He's still a child. Um, he's learning about how to do magic. It's it, it's very noticeable that George R. R. Martin is not giving us many Bran chapters. He started out, Bran was one of the main POV characters, but the, the more magical he gets, the more he starts to understand about the world, the less we see of Bran. We're, we're only getting three or four chapters per book at the moment. So um, don't expect huge amounts. But yes, I think, the, I think the answer is that the Children of the Forest do know. Blood Raven does know. They just haven't, they haven't said anything at all. Um, so, um, is that part of, uh, the North remembers, although clearly they do not? Um, yes, I think this is another part of that. It's, uh, it's very much, uh, an extra layer. The North remembers, uh, clearly the Northerners do not remember, uh, but the North as a whole, um, does remember. So, uh, because the trees remember. Oh, I thought I had another guest appearing there a moment, but they've <laughs> immediately gone away again. Uh, please come back. Uh, so, um, uh, we may well have a, an, another guest coming on in just one moment. Um, let's, uh, in the meantime, let's just have a quick look at the chat. Uh, Ethan S., thank you so much uh, for your donation. Um, uh, that's very kind. Uh, that's okay saying because at the moment Bran is eight. Yeah, exactly. This is the thing. He's just, he's just a child. Um, Hermione's uh, donated. Thank you very much indeed. Um, um, Andrew K saying after reading Fire and Blood, realised so many more parallels between Cersei and Rhaenyra. If we get any version of a Cersei reign, it will likely be similarly harsh and unpopular. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, that's that's one for me. It's one of the very clear things here. There is going to be she is going to be reigning in King's Landing, and um, she, we already see that. She wants to raise taxes. She doesn't really care huge amounts about the people. They're going to hate her. And she will be hounded out of the city in a very clear echo of uh, uh, what happened with Rhaenyra. Um, and that is one of the many things I think George R. R. Martin deliberately put into Fire and Blood and giving us extra detail so that we can then see the echoes in the story. Um, we do have uh, the guest uh, the, the guest that was promised, uh, who is going to magically appear with what looks like a very magical hat. And here you go. This is Matt hey. from Nerd of the Rings. Do you want to say hi? Hello. How's it going? Absolutely wonderfully. I'm delighted to see you. There. That is a fine, fine hat. It oh, well, thank said. you. I thought, I thought you know... Uh... It's a good festive occasion to wear wear the Gandalf hat today. So, I I wore a green shirt. Do you want me to to green screen my shirt as well? Is that what we're I, doing? Well, today? it's what all the cool kids are doing. I hear. <laughs> so, it's uh, I don't know whether you're here for the big beginning explanation, but I put I, I thought I'll wear a festive jumper, and then I set the green screen up, 
and this obviously and then, happened. Yeah. And I thought, I'd just go with it. It's uh, it's Christmas after all. Yeah. Um, but for those who do not know uh, Matt, I will big him up a little bit. Uh, he has a fantastic channel, uh, Nerd of the Rings. If you enjoy um, Lord of the Rings, Tolkien, Middle Earth, all of that good stuff, then I can think of no greater channel to uh, recommend to you. I'm sure that uh, if you're watching live, the moderators will uh, find uh, a link and put that in there. I'll also put a link down in the description later as well. Um, but how, how are you doing? Are you you all ready for Christmas? Uh, just about, yeah. Um, that's uh, part of tonight's activities is uh, the last bit of wrapping presents. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not Christmas Eve and wrapping presents, so I guess, you know, it could be worse, but yeah, we're cutting it a little close, but... <laughs> well, I I always wrap my presents on Christmas Eve. It's, uh, I don't oh, there I've you go. any of them yet. I'm <laughs> very last minute when it comes to that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, uh, it's not not a not a thing I look down on in the slightest. Um, yeah. We've got so um, one more. Thank you, anonymous. Thank you for your donation. Um, uh, so let's. I'll ask you. I'm sure we'll get a few Lord of the Rings questions coming yeah. through. But I just wanted to to, uh, to ask you. You were. Um, I know you've been watching. You're about to watch The Witcher. What What's your take on Witcher season? Yeah. Two? I, I blew through season two, actually, in like two nights. Um, yeah, I, I really liked it. Um, it's one of those shows like usually, um, you know, full disclosure, I'm not a Game of Thrones person. It's just a little too over the top for me, like as far as, um, you know, violence and nudity and stuff like that. It's just not my my style. Um, but the witcher season one like you know it, it has some of that i don't think it's quite as much as game of thrones from what i understand but um but it was just so compelling to me um like part of that is uh henry cavill's performance um but yeah i was just i was hooked on the world and everything and uh yeah season two i i blew through that really fast it's it's crazy when you can binge a show you kind of mm. have to take a breath afterwards and be like, oh, yeah, what all what all did I just see happen? <laughs> you know, <laughs> people ask like, oh, how was season two? It's like, I, gosh, I don't know. Where did he even start? Like it kind of all blends together after a while. It does. Yeah, I had to do. I mean, I, I, I did just blast my way through it, but I, I had to. I think after like four episodes, I had to just suddenly stand up, stretch my legs and go for a long walk yeah. just to let everything just <laughs> sort of go through my head. It, it reminded me a bit, actually, of um and I'm sure you've you've done this uh, you, when you say let's watch all of the Lord of the Rings films oh, yeah. in a day, um, and it's it's it surprises you quite how draining an experience it can yeah. be. So um, yeah, absolutely. yeah, it was only it was only what eight episodes I think they they did in this I season. Think so, but still, yeah. it's, uh, it was quite a lot of content. Yeah, I had to go back. I actually rewatched some of season one last night to refresh my memory. I guess I should have done that before season two would have made more sense, but <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, better late than never. Um, but yeah, I, and I just started uh, listening to the audiobook of last wish and oh, have wow. yeah. really been enjoying that so far. And like some of my, some of the most compelling episodes in my opinion were, were in the very beginning of that book. Um, so that was kind of cool to, to experience both uh both versions um i don't know i'm curious is in your opinion is is the show you know how faithful of an adaptation is that um the couple stories that i saw seemed like they were pretty pretty accurate but i haven't i haven't dived any deeper than you know the first quarter of the book well this is causing a little bit of uh controversy amongst book fans it has oh to so we're, um, we're bringing up a hot topic here Absolutely. And I, I was saving, uh, I, I had a question, let me see whether I can find it. I had a question uh, about this um, from Sebastian Jumala, one of my patrons. Um, uh, so I shall use this to sort of go go off and, and reply to that here. Um, <laughs> saying, uh, I'm massively disappointed, this is Sebastian saying it, I'm massively disappointed in the second season. Um, in my view, they made too many crucial errors. The story still feels fragmented, not immersive. 
Um, I like how the main characters were cast, minor characters not so much. Character development is literally non existence. Uh, Eskel and Vesemir's arcs were let down. Um, Yennefer, a shell of herself. Um, and then a whole load of like issues mm. uh, uh, that Sebastian picks up, uh, sort of in the plot that I won't spoil for people as we're going through. Um, and then saying that I feel like there's a reason that the books are a huge success because of how well they are written. Changing uh, that to something close in quality is really hard to achieve, uh, but uh, it doesn't work. So um, in particular here, saying the Slavicness is gone, leaving the locations empty. Mm -hmm. um, so as I say, this is a... Uh, something I've heard from a few people. These are book book fans, and I'm, yeah. I'm entirely understanding of book fans uh, being protective of their own um, uh, stories that they, they enjoy, and, and the same oh, to sure. a degree yeah. with The Wheel of Time, which uh, I think you've been watching that too. I have, yeah. The, I haven't seen the, the finale yet, so... Uh, no, I Maybe haven't. I'll either. watch it's, that tomorrow it, or tonight. It will be but... out. This is my one of my uh, my little rituals these days. It comes out about now. So when I finish oh, my okay. live stream, then I, I I always have to sort of relax down a little bit. So I've yeah. been watching that, <laughs> uh, which has been good. But there again, they've had to. Um, when I say had to, they obviously could have done it just scene for scene if they'd wished to. But right. in order to adapt it to the TV, they've made quite a few big changes. Mm. Um, now. So my take uh, on The Witcher, and it's interesting that you've read um, or listened to part of the short stories. Yeah. They, broadly speaking, were faithful. Yes, there are differences, but broadly speaking, they and, and that works quite well. So yeah. for season one, you can, yeah. a short story can turn into a, an episode of an the episode, TV yeah. show. That that works quite well. The, the problem they had, I was talking, we had, Helen on Clueless Van Girl a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, the, the problem they had, I think, is that the the you get two books of short stories, and then you get a five uh, novel series, and the, in a long timeline, and yeah. the first book of in that series is sort of a bridging story between what was happening in the short stories and the longer, the bigger narrative of, of the story. So it doesn't have this huge arc in and of gotcha. itself, um, but it kind of builds up to the bigger arc. So I have a feeling that they thought, well, we want to have some sort of arc for this season. So it yeah. isn't just kind of bitty. It, it does have a season arc. And as a result, they've, they've created um uh, some characters so voloth mir not a spoiler we know that that's a character that was created for the show that's not a book okay. character at all and that turns into being incredibly important in fact a central character to the plot um of of the season um mm -hmm. so that i quite liked what they did but for me what happened with a few of the characters did change them a little bit mm. Vesemir, who you won't have come across yet, but he's a much loved character uh, in the books. Also, in he's in the video in games. games. Yeah, um, and uh, so a lot of people were really looking forward to seeing him. And then he does a few things that you make make you go, "Is that?" I mean, the actor did fantastically, but is yeah. that what Vesemir would have done? Right. Similarly, Yennefer does something that you go, I'm not sure whether that's what she would have done. So I think mm. this is a lot of where where this is coming from, for me anyway. Yeah. I will say with, uh, with Yennefer in particular, you know, after season one, seeing, you know, kind of her potential power, I, I'll try not to spoil anything, but like w the, what takes all of season two, like you just don't, you don't see much there with her, which is kind yeah. of a bummer that like, you know, what, what was it a year, two years or something between seasons. So, you know, you might have to wait two more years. Um, yeah. It's kind of, yeah. So I can, I can see that. Um, Obviously, I don't I, I have never even played the games either. So I have like no knowledge base. Um, but it's been interesting watching Wheel of Time at the same time as I've been watching The Witcher um, because I start to like because I, I haven't read either one. So I start to get things mixed up in my head like, 
Hmm. Um, uh, I was, I, I kept thinking channeling as, from Wheel of Time when I was thinking yeah. of the magicians from Witcher, and I was like, "Oh, they call it chaos, and it's like it's a different thing, but it's kind of similar in a way." <laughs> it it is it is quite similar actually. The sort of the the concepts of yeah. uh, of that, although th- th- this obviously with the Wheel of Time, they've got this. It's in two parts. You know, you, right. you get the, yeah. the the male part and the female part, uh, which yeah. is which is a, a clear uh, difference. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I was I, I was interested to see what your thought as a as someone who's not read the, the books, mm-hmm. how they come across. And actually, I'd be interested in your thoughts on the Wheel of Time. Actually, while we're at it, yeah. <laughs> uh, but w- whether purely as TV shows mm-hmm. they work for you as sort of high fantasy. Yeah, um, I'd say of the two, and I I kind of struggle with this, like I said, because Witcher is a binge show; it all comes out at once, mm. so you can just keep plowing through whereas wheel of time obviously is on a weekly basis um so there's a couple not the most recent wheel of time but like the two episodes before that i felt kind of drug a bit there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot going on that i was really invested in and i was like okay let's let's do something let's go somewhere you know (laughs) um whereas witcher i felt like it was more of an exhilarating ride like there was stuff happening but I don't know how much of that is just the fact that I could just keep barreling through the episodes and I didn't have to wait a week before watching the next one. Um, so, yeah, I think I think, uh, you know, they've both piqued my interest for sure in their respective worlds. Uh, if I had to pick one or, over the other, I'd probably lean toward The Witcher a little more um, because, uh, well, for one, I think Henry Cavill is just awesome in that role. And yeah. uh, every time I, I hear him, you know, talking um about all the nerdy stuff that he's in i'm like this guy's awesome i love this guy <laughs> yeah, absolutely and and one of the things which uh i hugely appreciated was that he in 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 the books Geralt is is quite he's quite eloquent he's he's quite mm. I mean, I wouldn't say he's chatty, but he uh, he he does uh, sort of come out where he clearly speaks several languages. He's read a mm. huge amount of books. Uh, he, he he does engage in a lot of long, uh, quite philosophical conversations with people. Yeah. Um, and season one it wasn't really that. He spent a huge amount of time right. just grunting or yeah. randomly swearing. Or, right, just, yeah. Uh, he was brought and, to you by the letter F in the... In the yeah, season, yeah a lot of the time. And it was like, <laughs> it was it was not the character it, it felt to me like the from the video games are the kind of like the, the noises that you make when you accidentally bump into somebody and they go, <laughs> like that. Yeah. that that was the kind of feel i got but, so it didn't feel like the book but he did apparently push strongly for in season two for him to have uh, a slightly more eloquent yeah. character which i think did come across i can't remember him just sort of doing random grunts at all in season two he might right one or two, yeah but it was it was very different as a character yeah it's interesting you know i feel like it, it's pretty common with tv shows to kind of start to hit their stride in their second or third season and i think you know in my opinion i thought i thought you know there were definitely aspects of season two where we saw that um you know things were a bit more streamlined there wasn't as much stuff that we had to you know get explained to us we already knew a lot of the characters already um but yeah, I thought I thought it was really good. I'll probably go back and watch it again, which, um, you know, I can't say the same for a lot of, you know, like uh, Marvel shows and stuff. I've watched mm. all those that come out. And then once I'm done with those, I'm kind of like, eh, I don't I don't really feel the need to go back and watch those. Um, but yeah, for whatever reason, The Witcher, I, I thought uh, is one that I'll probably end up going back and watching at some point. Excellent. Well, I I would highly recommend you do, as I say, on a, a second watch through of, of season one. It was it was certainly uh, well worth it. Samuel, thank you so much uh, for donating. Kai Johnson, thank you so much uh, for uh, donating as well. And also, I think I had another one. Uh, Bell Moore, thank you very much. If you're just tuning in, I should say this is a charity live stream. So if you are enjoying it, if if you would otherwise do a super chat, uh, you can't do super chats. Uh, the the way to show your appreciation uh, is to give. It's it's in honor or in aid of uh, world builders, which. 
which is a fantastic charity. It's the idea is to to harness the generosity, the care, the love of the geek communities uh, around the world and try to help out those who are in need, not by sort of coming in and sort of saying, you're in need, I'm going to give you that, but actually trying to help build sustainable futures for people, uh, helping uh, education, helping build infrastructure where it's needed, not not coming in from above and saying that's what you need but talking to local partners trying to understand uh where where support is best given so it's it's a fantastically worthy cause please uh if you are able then please do uh give and we also we've got um just as a little bit of a a, a motivation for you perhaps as well we've got some uh, fantastic um uh, prizes that we're giving away if you donate here on the rest of this stream or anyway up to uh, the end of the year um, then you'll get added into a draw and we've got three things we've got $25 uh, voucher from my store we've got $20 voucher for uh, a fantastic tea company if you're a tea drinker uh, that do some very fandom based teas uh, and also a voucher for San Rixian's store San Rixian's a fantastic artist so um, if that uh, if any of those things appeal then please any donation any size of donation that gets you into that draw as well um, we uh, we had uh, when I had uh, Helen on, we were obviously were talking a little bit of Lord of the Rings as well, yeah. uh, and uh, we I did say that we have a question that she she thought you would have an, an answer to, oh. um, uh, which I did rather prompt, which is why <laughs> why why are why are elves the worst? <laughs> I wouldn't say they're the worst. I I do like to give Helen a really hard time because she. I, I don't think that elves are the worst, but I also don't think dwarves are the worst. And I think that's where our disagreement is. It's that she doesn't like dwarves, which I think is misguided. So <laughs> so the she, I think she's trying to twist it. So it seems like I'm an elf hater and she's a dwarf hater. I like them all. And I'm just trying to help her see the light of dwarves being awesome. <laughs> well that that sounds that sounds very fun. but I mean, but I'm... feanor is the worst I, I think she's, the worst. she's one of those feanor sympathizers for some reason she is yes and for those who are, are unaware of feanor um obviously i i've done a video on it i'm sure matt has as well but he's one of the the central characters in the the history of of all of middle earth he basically brings a whole load of elves back um not mm -hmm. in some uh, from uh, where they were very happily living in in and in, 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 over there in, in the sort of undying lands of nirvana uh, and he brought them back into uh, middle earth um not because of any wonderful altruistic means but simply just because he was on some uh mad raving uh, attempt to get back his possessions basically Huge oversimplification, uh, but he's the reason we can't have nice things, is what it yeah, is. Well, yes, uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I kind of, I, I sympathise with where he's coming from, uh, and I love the character, and I think he's astonishingly good. But at the same time, you have to go. Nah, that, that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't a good move. Uh, so uh, yes, Feanor, you can say is uh, is the worst. Um, <laughs> Uh, certainly Galadriel yeah. thought so. And um, and actually, so one of my favorite all-time characters is actually Elrond. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't say that elves are the worst by any means. I think uh, Elrond especially is one that I'm super pumped to see in uh, the Amazon show. Yes, because um, we, we will get, for those who don't know, this is going to be set in the second age, so several thousand years before the, the main stories that we know, which means that there's obviously quite a limited pool of characters who we met in mm -hmm. the, the the books, the main books, The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, the, the films, um, who may well appear there. And the two obvious ones that I, I think we're pretty clear are going to be appearing mm -hmm. are Galadriel and Elrond. There are other yeah. characters out there, and, and Sauron, of course. There are yeah. other characters out there who probably will be appearing, uh, yeah. but um, I think we can we can be pretty certain on uh, all of those. Um, okay, let's go to... Um, I have another couple of Witcher-related questions, I think, um, which uh, it would be interesting to get your take on. Um, See if I can find them. 
Uh, so uh, this is Mara Lee uh, question saying a question about Siri's relationship with elves both in the books and moving forward on the show what do you see will happen moving forward will it be the same like in the books or do you think the showrunners will change Siri's relationship with the elves and her father um, so I mean I will I'll, I'll sort of kick this one off as I know you've not read yeah. all the books <laughs> uh, but I'd, I'd be happy for any extra thoughts uh, from your side on this uh, so they have they've changed so the elves was one of the bits that they changed from the books they ended up in roughly the same place this is what happened with a lot of these things they ended up with roughly this in the same place um uh, in as much as they were do, probably doing what Nilfgaard wants uh without being part of the Nilfgaardian Empire uh, and that is and sort of taking it out on the, the north uh, so that is where they ended up most of the plot of how they got there is completely new for the TV show um, in terms of how Siri is uh, is going to be sort of how, how her relationship with the elves is going to develop now um, one of the other I think I think I haven't released it yet. I think this is one of the videos I've got lined up to go out over Christmas when I'm taking some time up is one about Siri's bloodline, uh, which mm. is really quite important and where this whole elder blood thing comes from, because um, she does come from, if you go back several generations, she is part Elvish. Uh, so there is that link in there. But her relationship to the elves is not, uh, the, the elves that we see there is not the most important part of what happens in the books going forward. Um, it's, it's the relation, what being a child of the elder blood means is going to be the important thing, which obviously is linked to the elves, but it's not that she makes friends with lots of elves and therefore that's, that's the driver of, of the story going forward. Um, what what was your take on the the the, the elves? Let's let's go with them. So, um, as I say, this was a a new kind of uh, bit of story. Yeah, not in the books that there was a whole arc that was going on. There. It ended in roughly the same place. The mm. the started in roughly the same place, but the middle bit wasn't the same. But would yeah. did that kind of work for you? Yeah, um, it was it was interesting to see elves that. Uh you know at least at time i mean they're they're complicated characters so like at at times you feel really sorry for them and then at other times it's like wow these guys are real jerks um so it was it was interesting coming from you know the lord of the rings super fan that i am where all the elves that we've met in adaptations have been pretty good you know <laughs> the worst mm. probably is thranduil who's just a little antagonistic toward thorn and that's about it so to see elves that are like uh murdering children and stuff it's like wow this is uh pretty intense <laughs> um yeah i yeah. mean I, I, I think you the further you go back into tolkien's world then the, the oh yeah for to, sure to yeah you get you, elves get, into, you get to yeah be you honest. get you definitely do yeah it's just uh you know like i said in, as far as adaptations we've seen, you know, we haven't seen any real jerk elves in, in Tolkien adaptations yet. I wouldn't be surprised mm. if we see some coming up. But um, yeah, I, honestly, it, it I had to the other day after watching season two, I had to pull up a map of the continent because I was like, where the heck are all these? It, it made me like tempted to do one of my videos on which instead just mm. so that I could learn where all these places are and what what's going on. So I could kind of wrap my mind around where all this is happening. Um, but yeah, the uh, I, I, I realize I might have said kind of a spoiler there, but uh, um, I thought that the scene where, you know, the um, I, and I'm going to I'm terrible at the names. Who's the the lead female elf francesca francesca yeah where she you know kind of toward the end of the season she kind of goes on a a path of revenge and like that mm. that scene was really i thought it was you know it was impactful and it was interesting how they did it uh you know without giving any way anything away i think you'll know the 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 scene on the street with sound as the main indicator of what has happened um and I thought that was yeah. really well executed. 
I, I, I would agree absolutely. It was uh, the the way that they did that. You knew exactly what happened. Yeah. Simply not by the music, not by anything. Else. It was just the, the noises of what was happening in the background, right. which was and I th- which was astonishing. Yeah, I love that, and I love that kind of storytelling. Like that to me, like uh, you know, rather than showing things, like when you're able to do that, I think it's potentially even more impactful when someone when the viewer's own imagination does the heavy lifting on something like that. And you're able to tell exactly what happened just by, you know, um, again, not giving too much away, but the way they use sound in that scene, you knew exactly what would happen. You knew it was horrifying and they didn't have to actually show you what happened, but you knew exactly what did. Yeah. Um, and actually, as a, as a sort of digression, I found this quite as a content creator, I found, I found that you're, you're sort of struggling with the giving away spoilers or not thing. Uh, this is something I'm trying to work my way through as well, because I've, I've previously I've covered like things like Game of Thrones, which is, yeah. as you say, it's, it's weekly. And there it felt quite easy that you would. Right. You know, once the show has happened, everybody's had a chance to see it. You can then uh, you talk about it and without worrying about spoilers but right. uh maybe maybe giving it 24 hours or something but i don't know how long you really need to give with a people binge yeah with a binge it's it's the, I, so i i just think some people have watched it all some people are probably <laughs> yeah. halfway through some people think well you know what i'll watch that over the christmas holidays or something right and and it's it's quite hard so um i think certainly in the new year then i will think that we can talk about it completely but uh, right. yeah i'm i'm figuring it out if uh, if anyone's got any way of uh, clever way of getting around this then uh, please do let me know but uh, it's it's something i've been i've been struggling with not quite knowing how to how to cover it all yeah it makes me really glad that amazon is doing its shows on a weekly basis when we get to oh, yes. the rings so i can absolutely have a little yeah. more clear guideline <laughs> and i think for the give the wheel the way that they've been doing the wheel of time i mean this isn't the only reason that they had it but i i think mm-hmm. that with the wheel of time they have been clearly trying out a few things that they might want to be doing with the mm. lord of the rings tv show yeah. um, you've got a, a, a epic high fantasy tv show uh, and then if it didn't work then th- they would probably tweak around a few things but right. i think they've now found a way roughly they were very happy with the audience figures apparently for, yeah. for wheel of time uh so um yeah i think there's a fair chance that we're going to be seeing pretty much the same yeah, a picture as a whole. I can't help but think, you know, I've seen all the the stats come out where you know they announced that Wheel of Times, you know, the number one watch show ever on Amazon and everything. And I'm mm-hmm. I'm just sitting here thinking like, wait till Lord of the Rings comes out. Like, that's, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, nothing it's against Wheel of Time, but I mean, I feel yeah. like Lord of the Rings has got uh, a little bit of a a jump start, I guess. I I. Th- think so too and I, I think this is one of the things just when i don't know if you ever uh have these kind of conversations with friends when you're uh someone's oh, so what's coming out they know you're interested in this kind of thing what's what's coming out and there are some things that you can easily describe and you can say uh, there's another season of the witcher do you remember that oh yeah yeah and then you can yeah. say the house of the dragon what's that oh that's that's a prequel to game of thrones targaryens and dragons and people go oh yeah i understand what that's about um with, with wheel of time you always had to like do a little bit more of an explanation before actually trying to <laughs> yeah. how do how do you how do you describe this in a way that doesn't make it sound like a generic fantasy thing because mm. it's not yeah. uh but it's uh so i think it was a bit of a harder sell than the lord of the rings is going to be easy everybody will understand right uh, what's yeah. going on there um uh thank you very much uh another Donation from Anonymous. Uh, Sasa K saying, uh, Carla Way has a question. It says that they can't donate from that region. Is there another way to donate? Um, uh, I, I think the answer is um, just going direct to the website is, is the best way to do that. Um, I, if it doesn't allow you to donate through the stream here, um, then that it must be a regional thing that for whatever reason so yeah if you go there's a link in the description i think i left it at the top of the description so if you click on that then you can donate direct to uh to world builders from there um let's go to a question from um uh, so mara lee is asking uh this is another question about uh, the witcher um 
So, uh, and this one might be a bit spoilery. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm making, as I say, I'm making this up as I go along. Uh, if you if you don't want any spoilers, then skip forward just a couple of minutes on this one. Uh, the question is about um, uh, the what ha- one of the things that happened at the end with the wild hunt um, and uh, Voleth Mir uh, going into uh, it would appear into the leader of the wild hunt um, and I've got a video if you're interested in what the wild hunt are I've got a video of that coming out in a couple of days um, because they are quite fascinating it has to be said they also you can probably gauge that they are important by the fact that one of the Witcher games Witcher 3 is called which are three wild hunt uh so they they have a sort of a bigger role going on there um which isn't apparent from just watching season two of the witcher um and we were not told this does not happen that that character volithmir as i say this is a character which was created for the tv show so what happened there we know that's all we know <laughs> so she has now gone into uh the leader of the wild hunt and i think the short answer has to be this is a bad thing um this is definitely not going to be a good thing in any way shape or form the bit that is not clear is whether it was her going in there made them do that kind of uh, rather come to us and join us, Siri, you can be a part of the wild hunt or whatever the the, the turn of phrase was. Uh, <laughs> because, as I say, that is not, they do get introduced relatively early. And I think it's in book two of the, the novel series of The Witcher. Um, and they do see Siri and there is a sort of a similar thing going on. But it is, again, it's, 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 reached in a different way so this in this sh- as a short answer is we do not know because they've not told us but the slightly longer answer is probably this is bringing it things or them trying to bring things around to roughly where the books were but having created this character of Olathmir, what you do with them uh well we'll just combine that with something else that's coming along later on in the story mm. um Let's go let's see. I, I'm I've been dotting around a little bit. I normally uh, have a whole series of questions in <laughs> order, but I've uh, because I've been sort of trying to pick on questions uh, uh, for different people. I think I'm now caught up with all my questions from my patrons. Uh, so now uh, what I'll do is I'll probably keep going um, for uh, well, I don't know. We'll see. We'll we'll uh, we'll go for a, a little bit longer. We've got some questions in the chat, but I'm wanting to encourage a few more donations before I go. This is I should probably say this is uh, this is going to be me signing off for the year after this one. So uh, so I will uh, if you keep on donating, I'm going to carry on talking. Uh, but uh, so uh, and then I'll just go to bed a bit later. So uh, it's it's up to you guys if you want if you want to carry on a bit longer, then we can do. Um, but uh, let's uh, go to um, a reflective round being saying that the website donation is giving at least one Australian an error message. Well, I, I'm i disappointed in that. I'm very sorry about that. Um, I'm sorry, Australia, if you are unable to, to donate. Um, what I would say is that if you wish to donate as a show of your uh, appreciation or whatever, then just donate to whatever charity you would uh, otherwise donate to. If you can't do it to this one, this is one that I picked, but um, I think this is a time of year to be proactively pr- paying it forward and, and helping out others. So uh, I would heartily encourage you to, if you can't do it to this one, do it to something else. Um, uh, let's go uh, have a quick flick through the chat. Have you seen anything in the chat you'd want to pick up on, by the way? Um. I have not. Uh, that's absolutely fine. Um, Oscar, I'll, I'll pick up on just a couple of things. Oscar the Westerman saying, speaking of Amazon, is anyone excited for Legend of Vox Machina? Um, I don't know anything about this, I have to say. I, I've not really heard about it. Do you know anything mm. about this one? I do not. No, I haven't haven't heard anything about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, what I would, as, as I've got you on here... Um, Rather than talking about just about the TV, the main Lord of the Rings TV show, I would mm-hmm. love your thoughts on um, something which there was an announcement at the time, but we've not really heard anything much since, which is the uh, an anime 
movie yeah. which is being made called War of the Rohirrim. And I yes. will just very briefly talk about the Rhymes issue, which is very complicated as far yeah. as we can tell. Um, uh, but I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what this might look like and what it might cover. But in terms of the rights issue, it appears we're in this strange world. We don't know all the details where Amazon hold the rights to be making TV shows. And uh, New Line, uh, Time Warner, hold the rights to be making movies, films. Mm -hmm. And so we're probably going to end up with this really quite weird uh, world of having two different franchises, based, both based in Middle Earth. So they will obviously be linked, but... Right they they will have necessarily be building their own worlds because the, the second age which is where we presume the vast majority of the tv show is going to be based it's not we don't have that much information they will have mm -hmm. to be creating their own stories they're going to have to be creating those their own characters and the moment that they start doing that then then that will take them out of uh, uh the the same universe as the the films and movies but anyway Digression on that, but what's what are you what are you expecting from this this anime? I I am really pumped for this one actually. Um, so we know we it's kind of been hinted at that this will tell the story of Helm Hammerhand, um, who was uh, king of Rohan um, during a very brutal winter um, in Middle Earth, and uh, I don't know. The, is it okay to? to kind of say the plot line of that or Absolutely, are we worried about yes. spoilers yeah. no here? no i think okay. I've, I've decided if, if something's been written yeah over half a century ago then okay that's kind of what i thought too. With, it's, <laughs> it's been a while it's been a while people um yeah so uh basically uh another group of men um kind of take over rohan for a period of time and helm hammerhand is trapped in helm's deep and um that's where we get uh we get the reference of the horn of helm hammerhand and basically what what he would do their situation got so dire there that um they were starving and everything and he would blow his horn at night and then go out and by himself and kill the enemy that was camped outside of helm's deep like sneak into their camps and everything and um I, I won't I guess I won't give away what what ends up happening to Helm Hammerhand, but um, long story short, he's he sounds like a uh, a very good choice for an anime movie to be based on. Um, I think it'll be interesting because it'll be, you know, a um, basically a man against man um, battle war, whatever you want to call it. Um, I guess war of the Rohirrim. They're it's considered a war, but, uh, but yeah, usually, you know, we've seen orcs as the bad guys for the most part. And, uh, this will just be men versus men in the kingdom of Rohan. Um, I don't know, you know, if there's room for any cameos, I could see maybe a Saruman perhaps mm, maybe. maybe. Um, but yeah, it, it feels pretty self-contained, but as far as, you know, kind of cherry picking, um, you know, self-contained stories out of Middle Earth. I feel like it's a really good one. Yeah, I do. I, I think it, it definitely is. Uh, as you say, it's self-contained. I think it it would work for work for a movie. Um, I think my where I'm coming from this is that I, I I'm wondering how they're going to present this because this mm. is this is set up in terms of who are the heroes here because this is set up very much kind of sympathetic to the road to, to rohan uh, to mm -hmm. the road hear him um but when you actually read the narratives helm hammerhand i think doesn't really come across as a particularly nice guy right um yeah. he's <laughs> uh he's uh just you know overreacting somebody comes in yes mm -hmm. and does something not good but he not only kills him but then hunts down the rest of his family yeah. this is kills him with a single punch by the exactly. way exactly yeah. yeah he does yeah i mean it's it's, it's hammer quite hammer but That's but at, yeah. at the same time you just go okay that was that felt like an overreaction, overreaction. there but then <laughs> but then he goes out and and basically says everybody who has ever known this person also must die and you go that doesn't sound that's not a mm. nice person were um, they so, were they i i couldn't remember i thought they were just like uh banished from rohan 
Yeah, well, so they would if they were came into Rohan, they would die. I think, oh, I, I think see. A couple okay. of, yeah. So, yeah. but it's like uh, he basically um, then becomes the central figure, and I, I'm mm-hmm. what I'm waiting to see is whether they make him like a hero or whether they're trying uh, to make him this kind of anti-hero. Or, right. Uh, where, where does he where does he fit into all of this? Yeah, I can see um, honestly one of the characters that. Uh, I'm most interested in is um, Freyloff, who is Helm Hammerhand's successor because uh, because he actually comes in toward the end of kind of that that conflict and that story and kind of retakes Edoras. Um, mm. So, and I think he's like I, I want to say that he's Helm Hammerhand's nephew. Um, so I, I kind of wonder if he might be a, you know, somewhat main role. I don't know. I'm just theorizing now. <laughs> yes. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think that I guess they will try and keep it quite tight um, yeah. into the main storyline, but I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure. We, as I say, we've not heard much about them. I mean, that obviously mm-hmm. the main Lord of the Rings TV show, they've been keeping a very close lid on absolutely everything. Oh, yeah. Uh, but uh, on this as well, we've, we had the announcement, um, and that's pretty much it, I think. Yeah. Um, had a quick uh, Sasa K just saying that this is the, the thing that was asked about earlier, that that's the critical role D&D animated, animated thing, uh, in which case I'm quite interested. Uh, so I don't know whether you've you've caught up on uh, critical role at all. Are you, are you aware of them? Not really. I've actually never done. I It's something I need to do. I need to do some tabletop gaming, but I've never actually done it. Well, it, it's a whole lot of fun. But it's yeah. and it's um, but this was a it was a YouTube channel initially, but they, they probably turned it into other things as well. And basically, I, during lockdown, it just exploded because oh, it okay. was uh, this just showing um, people doing D&D as an adventure. And, and it went really well. And then they decided they've turned this now. Uh, they've signed a deal and they're going to turn this into an animated a TV, show. Uh, a oh. TV show. So, um, yeah, I'm really interested to see how they go with it because I know certainly I... In, in the past, if I've, I've been playing that kind of game, and they, yeah. oh, they should they should make this into a movie. Yeah. Uh, this is so epic. Um, so yeah, I would I would love to see that. Um, uh, but That's uh, pretty yeah, cool. I didn't realize it was a good one. Amazon. Now um, I have watched. Have you ever watched the show Harmon Quest? Are you no. familiar with that at all? So it's no. uh, um, Dan Harmon. I think what's he write? He writes Rick and Morty and some some other things. He did Community um, as well, didn't he? I think so. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Um, but it's like him and like some celebrity friends and they basically do a variation of D and D and then they have animators animate their story and they're all comedians. So it's hilarious. The stuff that <laughs> their characters do. Um, but yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to have to check that out. Cause I, I thought that was really fun. Excellent. Um, and I'm being informed that it's even bigger on Twitch and they check the chat mm-hmm. on there, which reminds me, uh, this is also uh, simulcasting on Twitch. New word I learned a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, if, if you find it, I'm not paying attention to the chat over there. I'm not in, uh, doing anything other than just uh, putting it out on a different channel. Uh, but if you find it easier to uh, to watch this through there, then please uh, do uh, do that in, in the future. I'll probably carry on doing, uh, doing them both at the same time. Um, let's uh, let's do a couple more quick questions. Now is the time to, uh, to make final donations. Uh, if you uh, wish to do so, it would be hugely appreciated. Um, and uh, let's go to just have a quick flick through the the chat. I think I did see a question. Oh, yeah, there's a question. Mike Hall's coming up with a, with a question that we talked... Uh, Helen and I talked briefly about uh, you with your encyclopedic knowledge of the world of <laughs> Tolkien may, may be able to help us. Because uh, so, we would... The, the question comes out when I do these live streams most years, and I always forget to do my full research. Um, is there such a thing as, like, Christmas holidays or winter holidays mm. in these different fantasy worlds? Um, and so Helen and I um, thought 
there's obviously there is if you think about um, Numenor, then they had I think it was three times a year they they, mm-hmm. they sort of marked the, the sort of religious ceremony going up yep. Mount Tama. Um but in the sort of the third age and sort of moving forward, is there? Do you know of any other kind of midwinter slash Christmas festivals? Yes. So they they do Excellent. have what is called Yule. Um, and the interesting thing, because I've I've been called out on uh, my <laughs> my some of my videos where I make reference to the date February 30th. And I just kind of roll on without any explanation. And people say, what the heck are you talking about? February 30th. Um, so on the Middle Earth calendar, each month has 30 days. And then there's uh, things like midsummer that are outside of the actual calendar months. So they take place in between months. Um, and Yule is one of those things. And I actually had to pull it up here because I didn't know how many days. Um, <laughs> six day festival. It says um, wow. in the Shire. OK, but in the Shire calendar, it was two days. Apparently, I couldn't I couldn't remember the days and like when exactly it falls. But I do know that um, on their way back from uh, the quest of Erebor, um, Bilbo and Gandalf celebrate Yule at Bayorn's house. So they are there at Bayorn's house uh, for that yes. festival. I yeah. vaguely remember that now. Now you say it. it's uh, yeah. oh, this is this is good knowledge. It's which um, seems like a good place to celebrate Yule to me. As long as you like honey, I think that's yeah. a, that's an excellent thing. Um, yeah. And and who doesn't love honey? <laughs> um, thank you. That that's the, exactly the kind of knowledge that I have. Experts like you coming onto this channel <laughs> for um, it was. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of creating my own little hierarchy of uh, in, excellent nerdy knowledge. I, I think. Um, uh, when I had uh, Girl Next Gondor on, and she uh, she happily recited all of the houses of um, um, I've even forgot the name of the city now, but uh, the 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 Gondolin, Gondolin, yeah, the, yes. the, the the houses of Gondolin, and she just nice. rattled them all off, uh, wow. and it was just that's that's impressive level. level yeah, level. it is. <laughs> Okay, um, I think uh, with that, though, I am going to start wrapping this one up. Uh, if you uh, are watching this and not live and you would like to donate, you still can. Uh, there will be a link somewhere on your... Actually, this, this jumper looks even weirder when I move my arms around. Um, so, but there will be a, a link somewhere. I'm going to keep the link up there. It's a fantastic cause. Please do uh, donate generously to that um, if you at all can. Um, I'll give you a moment uh, to direct people to where you are, but I shall let people know um, what's uh, coming up for me. I always, oh, I almost got through this without um, thanking my patrons, which have been horrendous patrons thank you uh you know i can't do the this the, the dedicate the time that i do without your support so i hugely appreciate it thank you very much um uh, matt do you want to let people know where to find you on the internet sure yeah uh it's nerd of the rings uh so youtube.com slash nerd of the rings um that's the main one i'm on uh instagram and twitter and stuff like that i don't use those as often but uh yeah check me out on on YouTube, I will have a video coming out on Christmas Day because Saturdays are my regular release and I'm a creature of habit. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, excellent. That's a thing to look forward to. I, mean, I never know whether Christmas Day is a good day or a bad day I, to, uh, to yeah. release things on, but um, uh, well, I, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Um, Absolutely. I, I, hopefully, we can get you on again for a sort of a normal uh, nerdy Lord of the Rings stream at some point. That would be fantastic. Absolutely. Um, now, uh, what else was I going to say? Just to wrap up, uh, yeah, this is my last one. So there's not going to be of the year. There's not going to be a live stream next week. I will be back in two weeks' time. Uh, so um, please do have yourselves a fantastic, wonderful uh, uh, break. If you celebrate Christmas, I hope you have a fantastic time, family and friends, and just recoup. I'm definitely planning on doing that. I'm going to uh, eat, drink, be merry, and basically relax and sleep a lot as well. So um, uh, thank you, everyone. It's been a fantastic year, I think. 2022 is going to be amazing even better year with so many fantastic tv shows and uh coming out including lord of the rings um including um house of the dragon westworld season four is hopefully coming out as well we've got a lot of things to look forward to so take care everyone and i shall see you next year <laughs>